You staying home tonight? Home tonight? I hadn't planned. I don't know. I don't plan on it. Plan on it. This is the action. <laughs> Minus five. Four. Three. Two. One. Booster ignition and liftoff of Discovery. You're gonna die. I'm Raymond Arroyo. We'll see you next week. A round of applause for me. Uh, we're here back in the show. We got um, we got Sharbel, our special guest. We got Kyle still in the closet, and also special guest Adrian, who's also in the closet, providing production backup to Kyle. How are you doing, Kyle? I'm doing great, man. Great yeah? to be here. Yeah, you got your. Is that a Gators jersey? Uh, this is actually an illegal Tim Tebow jersey. You can't buy a college jersey with a player's name on the back. It's a <laughs> against the NCAA mm. and I would like to say that I bought it to like fight the man but it was like 20 bucks online from China so okay all right okay we'll look over that that could be changing soon you know what could be NCAA is considering paying their players compensation for the players dude they should do that a hundred percent there's so much money in college football like there it's is. crazy is it kind of hot in here it's a little no, hot no, I, I'm fine I was okay. just thinking I take this off <laughs> Um, we need to introduce Sharbel here and Adrian. Uh, so Sharbel, why don't you give a little introduction while I open some Topo Chico's for those us are, to do. Those are delicious. So Sharbel and Adrian, this is kind of cool because Sharbel and Adrian are both new to Grapevine, just moved here, and we both of you kind of, I sered, serendipitously, is that the word? Serendipit? There's a D in there. There you go. There was a T in there. Serendipitously. <laughs> yep. Uh, I met both of you Nailed just like it. kind of through, well, one through a mutual friend and then Adrian at, at Redefine. So Sharbo, how do you, how, what's your, your bio is, give, give everyone your bio, give everyone your like cocktail. This is who I am. Sure. Your introduction. Okay. Well, uh, I'm a designer, self-taught designer since I was a teenager and mm -hmm. uh, before that, and since then also an artist, I would sketch a lot. I think that's what led me into design. Eventually got into tech, mm. design, merged with tech, but then I still went really wide in my career. I yeah. covered anything from websites to mobile apps, all kinds of software, designing curriculum for tech companies, yeah. education, interior design. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I've remodeled a home or two in my in my day. Wow, that's mm -hmm. cool. Mm -hmm. uh, so that got me into woodworking and... Um, Food design is something mm. I especially enjoy. Like designing arts. how it looks or how, like is a, is a chef a food designer? I believe so. Okay. I believe All so. Right. I okay. believe you're designing the entire experience. Okay. As a chef and restaurateur, you're designing everything from the moment someone calls in or walks in mm -hmm. all the way until they're paying that check and walking out. Okay. And, and what, what happens in the between. whole experience, the whole experience. Yeah. And then everything from the plating, the, the cooking, of course, the food, yeah. how they design the ingredients together how it all comes on the plate, yeah. how it's presented and served, et cetera, et cetera. So big into that. And I love studying that to understand like how I might apply that yeah. to tech work or, or to any other kind of work I'm doing. So I, what I do, and this it's never been easy to describe what I do. What I do as a designer is I borrow from all kinds of different disciplines yeah. and I put them in my pocket. And as I come up with problems or come across problems, either for myself or clients to solve, then I'll pick from this yeah. big old toolbox and yeah. think, wait, what if we applied this? Because yeah, yeah. it's never really thought of in this industry, but why don't we try to bring it over here? Yeah, yeah. So. And, strat and some of this stuff, like the, uh, you started an agency called Sprintwell, where you ran these kind of design sprints and maybe we well, could geek out about the design sprint stuff sure. maybe later, but yeah. that, I think that's really cool. And you've worked with a lot of cool companies and then um, just recently moved to Grapevine and then a mutual friend, which we should give a shout out to Patrick. Oh, how do you pronounce his last name? Patrick, uh, uh, uh this is good. Hodgman. Uh, <laughs> Serendipitous. <laughs> uh, Hodgden. 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 Patrick was like, Hey, you two should meet. And then yeah. you showed up. I, I just, like, you showed just kind of showed up. I really up. did. I said, <laughs> yeah. I'm coming over. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. visiting. So that yeah. was super cool. Uh, before we go on, I want to introduce Adrian. If we can unmute Adrian's mic. So Adrian also just moved to Grapevine. Yes, sir. Uh, we met at Redefine, the local favorite coffee shop right down the street yes, that I go to almost every day. And um, you noticed my backpack. I did. Yeah, you're like, is that a Peak Design backpack? Hmm. Yeah, so I am a huge fan of branding. Mm -hmm. And so 
I'm always looking for creatives out when I'm just doing photography, like street photography, out in the shoot, or just walking around. Like that's a peak design backpack. That guy's a photographer. Oh, do you have, here, let me show the camera. That's your peak design backpack right there. Yeah, flexor right here. We're, we're like, oh, there you go. There you go. There it is. Yeah. So whenever it's a very you, specific like YouTuber yeah. backpack. So whenever you see this backpack, you are probably like this guy's probably a photographer. It's like ninety nine percent of the time. Yeah, yeah. But it's just a good backpack. But it's yeah. expensive. So you're you you know a photographer cares about their gear. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Costs like hundreds thousands of dollars. So they're gonna. Put well, wait. The backpack. backpack doesn't yeah, cost hundred thousand backpack. dollars. The backpack's like I think it's like what <laughs> two eighty. Like Must be a bill wow. Adrian just billion dollar on, company. Adrian no, no, just no. put me on blast. He's like, no, no, we no, both no, have a hundred thousand dollar backpack. That's not yeah, yeah. putting on blast. That that's impressive. If you've got a hundred, I know, but that's kind of like putting me out there like that, right? If it was a hundred thousand dollars, and Adrian just like put that out there, like we both own. Yeah. Like are, are those your Ferraris out? Parked yeah, out yeah, both yeah. of them. Oh, okay. Yeah, gotcha. they're leased though. They're, they're leased. leased. <laughs> yeah, no. So when I see like that backpack, I knew this guy's a photographer. So I asked, "Hey, you're a photographer, right? What do you shoot?" He's like, "Kenny USR. I have this thing. Uh, yeah. you should come by one day." I was like, "I have a studio right down the street. You should yeah. come by." He's like, "I just moved to Grapevine from California, from California Same here. to save money to and save to money. just like hustle." And he's like. He's like finding photography gigs, videography gigs, just like connecting with people out here just to save up money, pay off debt, like yeah. help his family members and like make a living out here. So I really respected that. I was like, dude, come over. Let's let's talk. Yeah. So I'm on route to be financially free, hopefully. Well, with some upcoming projects coming up, hopefully by April or May, yeah, pay nice. off the rest of the car, student debt. How old are you? 23. Nice. 23. Single. Nice. No kids. I repeat that to like because it's it's. Yeah, it's pretty funny. Like, oh yeah, twenty three single no kids because it's it's important to consider like twenty three you know, single three kids. Yeah, <laughs> right. it's, it's it's just important to like consider like well like if if you feel, if you're twenty three you're single no kid you can do this right. Yeah. Maybe you can do it in California. Maybe you have to move out of California to do it. Maybe you can do it in Texas. Maybe you need to move somewhere else, right? I respect the hustle, yeah. man. Like to move to a different country or a different, different country. <laughs> different move, state. Well, Texas is a different country. That's what I've basically heard. Yeah. But to move to a different state, like just to do the hustle, I really respect that. Yeah. So I'm glad you're here. You're shadowing Kyle. Where were you when you were 23? Where were you in your life? Where was I when I was 23? I was in Toledo, Ohio. I was in Mountain View, California. Doing what? What was your job? Commuting to Google for work. Oh, really? Awesome. Yeah. And what did you do at Google at the time? At that time, I was in product support. Mm -hmm. And what I would do is respond to people's emails saying, hey, the product's not working. Or Really? Like what type of product? The very first product I worked on was Orchid. Orchid? Or <clears throat> or, or, or cut or cut or cut. Can we look this up? Or cut. We should look it up. It was, it it was Google's unofficial first attempt at social media. Really? That's right. Wait, so this was before like a uh, Google, what was it? Google plus or something? Before, or? Way before Google way before plus. That. Okay. And or cut. Is it, is this it? it? That's wow. the one. And it was especially popular, believe it or not in Brazil and Estonia. Why is that? I learned, we still have no clue to this day. <laughs> uh, I so I basically learned Portuguese. No joke. I Are you learned, serious? I learned Portuguese because I don't know. All throughout, like half of the support tickets came yeah. in in Portuguese. Oh wow! And I would start responding in partial Portuguese. I would I would end. Was Google Translate with, uh, that effective back then? <laughs> wasn't around. <laughs> wow. Wasn't around. That's yet. wild, man. Yeah. This is this was two thousand four. So and then walk me through. I think it'd be interesting for people that don't know to kind of, and maybe people are a little aware of this, like strategy sprints, sprinting, that kind of stuff. Yeah. I think it'd be cool if you're willing to go into that a little bit. So like when you were at Google, what was the, what's the whole history behind this like sprint stuff, this like design sprint, strategy sprint. I mean, people that do graphic design or branding, like it's becoming really popular right now. Yeah. Um, in the like graphic design branding area, but it kind of started in the tech area. These sprints and stuff and it's all from Google, right? Like Google came up with that or when I was there, oh four to oh eight, it wasn't a thing. Mm -hmm. It hadn't even technically been invented yeah. yet. But even before the design sprint, engineers and tech team, technical teams, engineers, developers, they were already doing agile sprints or running okay. agile sprints. <laughs> In essence, it's a, a two week, usually yeah. two weeks, you come together, you decide what features you're going to code for that two week sprint. Yeah. You all swarm together, you code, you get it ready at the end of the two week sprint. Yeah. You show it and you ship it. Is this kind of like prototype? Was this like coming out of the idea of like, let's prototype a product before we, cause Google just had all these different, like, like prototype 
services that they were testing and stuff? Not, not even quite yet then. So from this agile sprint concept, you, know, you run your team in an agile way, you run these two week fast code it, yeah. demo it, ship it. Then there's design thinking, design thinking popularized by IDEO is all about how do you empathize with the people you want to create a solution for design mm -hmm. a solution for yeah. and start to frame the, the problem that you're trying to solve, mm -hmm. prototype it, okay, test it, and then be able to confidently know like what the, the right yeah. solution is to, yeah, yeah. to design and to build. Um, so Jake Knapp is a, he was a design partner uh, at Google Ventures. Okay. And he worked on some teams, I think some product teams within Google as well. What's Google and Ventures? Is that like a? It's their, it's their, like their venture capital arm. They, gotcha. they invest like an incubator in type? various startups partially. Okay. So they either straight up invest in startups or they also help, they'll help incubate. Yeah, yeah. So what he was doing as a design partner is he's working with all these founders of various startups and he started to imagine a little bit, well, how is it that these engineering teams and developing teams, how do they work in this fast, lean kind of way for two mm -hmm. weeks at a time? Mm -hmm. And there's design thinking and all this design work that we do. Is there a way to try to merge these together so yeah. these startups who you know don't have a whole lot of time and a lot of resources to be developing and building all kinds of different features? I mean, it's very costly. And yeah. they need to gain traction. They need to figure out, you know, are we really onto something and, yeah. and are we going to survive? Yeah. So it ends up coming up with a couple of the other Google Venture de design partners as well. They come up with this approach where from Monday to Friday, you are imagining a particular uh, goal that you have okay, with uh, whether it's a new business altogether or a new feature. And from there, you, you set your long term goal. You understand who you're, the people that you're trying to serve and trying to solve a problem for, what their map, their journey is like. Mm -hmm. You map their journey out. Mm -hmm. And day two, you're sketching a variety of ideas. Day yeah. three, you're making a decision about one idea to mm -hmm. move forward with yeah, yeah. based on a very particular part of this customer journey. Thursday, you're prototyping that one idea. All the other stuff you brainstormed, you just keep it for later. Yeah, yeah. But you pursue that one idea that you agree with as a team, and then by Friday you're putting that prototype in front of five potential users or customers. Yeah. yeah. So, so you spent one week, and the other cool part about it is you might you have all of these team members in a room, but you're able to rapidly kind of make decisions too. You get everyone on the same page, you test something, and then is this related to lean startup kind of movement as well? Like this was lean a big startup thing. came before it. Okay. And it was popular in this whole there's build, a book. measure, learn. Yeah, there was a book, the Lean Startup. <clears throat> Absolutely. Yeah. So build, measure, learn is this cycle from Lean Startup. And what the design sprint attempts to do is to say, before you build it, mm -hmm. learn. Hmm. Skip right to learning. Yeah. So before you build anything, before you write a line of code, and then this has gone well beyond code, and the clients I've worked with and the people I mentor and coach now, this could be anywhere from anything I should say from a tech startup yeah. to a podcast yeah, yeah. to a YouTube channel yeah. to a restaurant. Mm -hmm. I've prototype. I've used a design sprint to prototype a food truck. Concept, That's cool. That's super cool. Right? I, I invited friends over. Yeah. This is a few years ago. I set my kitchen up as though it was the food truck, mm -hmm. took orders, handed out the food, you know, as yeah. though they were coming up to the truck window and I wanted to create that experience, but I did it all within a week. Yeah. And for me, and I think for what's important to me and kind of the direction I'm going with Sprintwell, it's important for me to share because it really resonates with me what you're saying about living debt free. You know, where I'm taking Sprintwell, which is the the name of the the business I started a few years ago, running sprints for for companies, for startups, for bigger companies. Um, I still was feeling like I wasn't serving the person I I resonated with most the person mm. that i really connected with most and that was like my old self yeah it was this ideas guy this person who has lots of ideas sees gaps in the world wants to fill these gaps and these unmet needs and we get filled with lots of ideas and i'd start to do one two three four i'd start to work on a bunch of them and none of them would ever really take mm. off and, yeah. and really get off the ground but design sprints gave me a chance to say i can really 
dream big and think about lots of different ideas, I can diverge, so to speak, yeah. like what we call like in you know design industry is I can be divergent, but then by the middle of the week, I'm starting to converge mm. and come back down to earth, pick one thing, roll up my sleeves, think with my hands, build this prototype, yeah. which doesn't takes about a day. Mm -hmm. And then I can put it in front of five real people at the end of the week and, and figure feedback. out if I'm on the right track or not. Yeah. And you've talked about, well, I mean, up until the, up until that point of having that realization, like I want to help me in the past, you had been working with a lot of big companies. I mean, uh, companies that, you know, can pay for that and your comp I mean, I don't know if you want to say this, but like you, you've done, you've been successful with Sprintwell. Sprintwell has been a successful thing that you've, you've started. And, um, but I like the idea of helping individuals or like helping maybe not LinkedIn help. Like how do we help individuals to start sustainable companies or sustainable businesses or products? And that's really fascinating to me. Yeah, I, I think the transition for me has been because like most people don't think like we do all this, this stupid show and this, I mean, not stupid, but like, come on, shout out to all the fans, but uh, thank I, you. I, listen, Patreon com slash the show <laughs> <laughs> sports on Patreon buy drink studio coffee. But what I mean is like, like people think you have to have a million fans to like live. And then there's that Kevin Kelly article that I always talk about a thousand, thousand true, fans. true fans. Like, like there's so much opportunity to do something you love and make us make a reasonable salary doing it. And yeah. to like help people get to market with their idea and think through it is, is really cool. Like it's really exciting to do that. I, I've been doing this for over 20 years design that is. And because I took such a wide path in my career, I gained so many different experiences in different industries, different ways of solving problems. And for the longest time I would feel like, well, then what do I, what mm -hmm. do I do? Like mm -hmm. what, what's my specialty? What's, what am I good at? Yeah. Because I'm a little bit good at a little, a lot of bit little of bit of things. Right. Yeah, yeah. And I don't think that came out right, but it sounded great. It thanks. sounded like a country song. <laughs> oh, I'm a lot of good at a little bit of, or a lot of little bit of things. It sounded like a country song. I mean, we, we are in Texas. A whole now, lot so. of little bit. I'm trying to embrace know. Texas is what I'm trying to do. I think you're doing a good job. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you. No, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Let's I'm not sure. Uh, but my point is getting really good at prototyping and validating if this product or service or podcast or sh whatever it is, yeah, if it's going to actually become something yeah. and really getting good at figuring out how do I really get that first customer, mm -hmm. someone yeah. who's willing to exchange the money yeah. for the service, for the value or for yeah. the product. My point is I've, I've had a really blessed career in terms of the places I've got to work at, uh, the people I've got to meet. Um, so many of my coworkers have gone on to become New York times, bestselling authors, That's cool. founders of companies that, you know, you know, the name, if I mention that, yeah, yeah. um, it's, it's an honor. It's an honor to have worked with these folks. And then as I built Sprintwell, it's the third business I've built. The first one I did, I created when I was a teenager. Second one was when I was around 24, 25. Wait, what was your first business as a teenager? I was building websites and oh, designing wow. websites. That's cool. So I'd go around, I'd teach workshops at my, uh, my hometown's local library. How old were you? 15. What you were 15 and yeah. you were building websites. Yeah. When was this? What year was this? 1996, 97. Oh my gosh. Yeah. 96, what were you building on back then? Like, what was the, you ready for this? Yeah. First, it started off as front page. Oh, okay. And then Dreamweaver. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I think I remember OG. Those. This is OG. I barely remember that. OG I think the first design. computer my parents got was a windows 95, mm -hmm. like a windows 95 computer. Oh yeah. 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 I remember that startup sound and everything. It was oh, so it was great. Beautiful. And then beautiful. when, when we got like internet, internet, like AOL internet, Oh, that was, the, that was a big deal. It was the, I would ache to come home from school and find out if in the mailbox is one of those sweet CD ROMs, the CDs. <laughs> CompuServer, <laughs> yeah. AOL, and hope yeah, that, dude. yes, I've got another thousand yeah. hours. It's so crazy. Cause like that, that was such a massive shift in it. Like, like people that have been born post internet or post that are not going to witness that. I mean, the only other massive shift 
that seems similar but isn't even as big is like the iPhone. The, phone. the iPhone. Like that was the only other thing. But like other than that, like the internet, the internet, that's yeah. such a like I mean that's a that's a turning point in history. It's so crazy to think about. Everything we have today, we see today, and this is this is a big reason why I'm I'm shifting kind of the focus of who I, I serve through Sprintwell. Um well I was saying so the first business fifteen, second business, it was a generic design agency again. Uh, built that with a really good friend and it took us seven years to reach seven figures. Mm -hmm. Didn't really understand how to build a sales pipeline. Yeah. Didn't understand how to close deals. What fast. years was this? 2000? That second one was. Oh, eight. 2008 to 2014. Okay. And it was just you and your partner or 2015. It's just you and one partner. Right. Nice. And so we, we, you know, we'd bring on contractors to help with if we were to take on bigger projects, but the problem was we took on anything and everything. Mm. We were all things to all people. Yeah. You want a new logo? Yeah. We design logos. You want to, you want an annual report design for you? We do print design. Yeah. You want a new website? We do websites. Yeah. Right. And it didn't matter. We do dog food. We'll do. Oh yeah. I mean, we'll yeah. Yeah, I'll we'll walk design, your dog. We'll I'll design airplanes. I'll design the route. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, we design airplanes. Air, hel yeah, helicopters were my favorite. <laughs> then you're like going through the directory, like airplane designer, like looking for. So okay, funny story. To find a contractor, right? So well, this is what. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. literally how I. What took us to the next level of that business was, we had a contract with a major university, and. They were they were asking us, if they if we would interview. I said that funny interview. If we would, <laughs> if we would interview folks who uh, understand, like basically a technical product manager role or a okay. technical project manager role, like interview for that, Inter like like be the recruiters or something. They just wanted me to help vet these folks. Gotcha, gotcha. Because uh, they didn't have the technical, ex the yeah. technical expertise. Yeah. So, as I'm listening and they're saying, so as long as you know, if you if we could just ask you to interview a few folks and just help us vet them, and yeah, and I'm like, yeah, sure, no, I'd you know, be happy to. And I'm thinking, well, this is related to the project that we're working on. Yeah. Uh, what exactly are you looking for? Mm -hmm. Everything she describes, basically, we could do that. Yeah. I didn't have the deep technical chops to do it. Neither did my partner. But I said, well, what if we took this on? Yeah. Right. And and I understood what their salary was going to be and the benefits and all that. And I said, look, why don't you just knock off the benefits? Yeah. And just contract go us. into a contract with yeah. us on the salary. Yeah. So. That was what took us to the next level. That was the first six figure contract I had, I had sold. And, and uh, six figure a year contract, six fi like what what is what do you mean by I'm always con I'm new to all of this th sure. this game. So when you say like a six figure contract is that like the lifetime of the contract or it was for at that time if I remember correctly I'm pretty sure that was a 6 month budget. Yeah. So, so you and your partner was about hundred K you and your partner came back budget. and you're just like, we're getting little Caesars tonight. <laughs> oh, <laughs> we are yeah. plus we're bread partying. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We're going to extra breadsticks, yeah. extra sauce yeah. packets, please. Give me that sauce dog. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we That's cost extra. Like I know. We're not going to little Caesars tonight. We're going to big Caesars. <laughs> Dude, you must have freaked out when, when I, that contract came in. I, I'm walking out to the parking lot thinking I'm going to urinate in my pants. <laughs> Just, That's what I've been thinking. Like a little tinkle. Yeah. You know? It was just like a little tinkle, <laughs> a little tinkle. And thought, oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. That's the first yeah, yeah. 100K contract I've ever closed. Yeah. And then you got to do all the work. Then we got to do all the work. So yeah. then I had to hustle, find technical product managers, find out, you know, hey, do you know this kind of technology? Do you know that kind? Yeah, Are yeah. you used to working with university? Yeah. So it was a whole thing. So I had to go and basically backfill the personnel. And this, is, this is good advice that I've realized, uh, you know, trying to share what I'm learning. It's not that hard to land the big contract. What is hard is fulfilling on it fulfilling in a way it. where not only they feel good, but you feel good. Like, Absolutely. Like it's not just about them feeling good about it. It's also the pressure it puts on you because you know, I've never done a six figure contract and you are stressed and you need to make sure that you're delivering on it. So I'm trying to start like, like estimating like a 20% extra effort or work on my behalf. If it's like the first time I've, pitched a contract that high. So like, if it's going to be, if it's the first time I'm pitching like, um, a five figure contract, like, and it, and it, I've never pitched a contract at that level. <clears throat> like I'm, I'm estimating even more time because I know there's going to be extra like anxiety on my part. Um, 
Like, is the client happy? I'm going to do an extra phone call to the client. I'm going to do right. an extra, like, go over and above because you're just nervous, you know? One of the best pieces of advice that I got after that second business. Yeah. So I learned a lot of things the hard way in that business. Yeah. As I said, we were all things to all people. We never had a consistent proposal or contract. So every single proposal we were writing from scratch because everything was a custom job. Yeah. And then it became this chase for the next client, the next client. Nothing was ever systematized. Nothing was ever operationalized. So I learned a lot of things the hard way in that. But one of the best lessons I learned and got this advice later for the third business, Sprintwell, was always have a 20% contingency baked mm. in. Mm. Yeah. So you figure out all your costs, where are you going to break even? This is what the cost of, you know, our talent is. And that's, you know, where the, mm -hmm. where the profit margin comes in or the, you know, you're, you're essentially, this your is what cost or, is, but you got to mark, mark it up, up yeah, right, yeah. to make a profit, um, market value and all of that. And then at the very end, even after travel room board and all that, it's contingency. What's this 20%? Uh Oh yeah. Yeah. The client starts to dip into a little scope creep. Yeah. Like, well, could you do a little extra or could we have a little extra phone call? I've got plenty of clients who are like, yeah. Hey, you know, something comes up, something comes up. Like, right? Hey, I just need personal advice. I, like you just never know. Yeah. Yeah. You just never know. Yeah. Right. So that extra 20% is always a nice cushion. Yeah, for sure. So what, one of the questions that, uh, someone submitted, I mean, I didn't want to go right into that yet, but it came, no but, but I thought of this just now, who's the, after all of your experience, your variety of experience, what's the worst, uh, job or boss experience you've ever had? Ooh, cause like your, wow. your career trajectory, where'd you go to college? Stanford. And then, and then when did you work for Google? 2004 to 2008. Okay. So this was so I graduated in, between, in 04 in between your 15 year old business and then your, or yes. when you're 15 and then the exactly. second business. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So, and then, so Google, what other like actual jobs have you had? Okay. But I don't mean like actual, you know what I mean? Like yeah, you had a boss. No, no, I get it. I get it for sure. My very first job, it was two jobs. Okay? Summer, what, what year was it in high school? Basically, high Al, school. Allie Hoffman. <clears throat> Allie Hoffman. Allie, I promise you I'm going to answer your question. Um, I I did work at my high school in order to pay, you know, cover my tuition. Mm -hmm. I would work in the summers. Wait, to cover your tuition at, oh, for college? At, at, no, at a private, for, at my private high school. Your parents, um, dude, that's next level. Your parents made you pay for your high school tuition? No, 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 no. It wasn't, they made me, I, I opted in to, wow. to do like work to pay uh, off your own tuition work to, to help cover costs. What right? a nice thing to um, do. That's well, super in, nice. In the, in the school, I mean, I love my high school and everybody involved yeah. there. Um, it, the community is amazing. They, they always took care of my family. They were mm. always good to my family. Yeah. And part of what I wanted to do and, and what we agreed to is, well, let me, let me work, right? Yeah. Let me, let me earn this. Man. Um, so I would trim rose bushes for the Damn. brothers um, and the priests. Um, Wait, their, so where'd you go gardens. to high school? I went to St. Mary's High School in okay. Stockton, California. And what were the brothers? The, the They're the Oblates of St. Francis de Sales. Yeah, okay. And so I have a were, friend, Craig uh, Craig Irwin, who entered the Oblates. Yeah. They're they're fantastic, yeah, man. They're cool. I love them so much. So yeah. there there were brothers and priests there, and um, I think they were Dominican sisters, but I I'm, mm. I'm, could be wrong about that. Um, in any case, on their grounds, they had in like their living quarters, they had yeah. all these beautiful rose bushes. They had all kinds of office work to do, you know, stacking papers and and whatnot. And I would just, hey, just give me the work, whatever you need me to do. So yeah, I, would, yeah. I would, you know, trim rose bushes and do a bunch of office work stuff. Are you setting this um, up to be the worst job you've ever had? Not even close. Oh, okay. It's quite. <laughs> it's actually one of the best I've had. Okay, okay. Um, but at the same time, so that was my that was my first that was your shift. First job. Okay. And the second shift, I would go to, I would go to our local gym. And I was, I was a janitor okay. at our local gym. So yeah, and, and gross. that would That's give us gross. the, it was gross in so many ways. Was that the worst job you've ever had? Still, unfortunately not the worst. I'd, oh still, my go, gosh. I'd still go back to that okay, based okay. on some managers okay. I've had. Um, so I say all that to say, like you'd think being a janitor or a gardener or landscaper, you know, all of that can be the worst jobs. I loved every minute of that work. I really do believe if you have an opportunity in your career and you're not doing necessarily something like construction or, um, you know, you're like, you lay tile or you like know, manual labor, manual labor. If that's not what you're doing and 
and you're in so-called knowledge worker. You know, I was just going to say knowledge right? work. Yeah. Like yeah. What, the, what the term is. Yeah. Um, I think as much as, and I've laid tile, I've laid tile. I've, I've done that work and it is backbreaking. I mean, it's yeah. hard work. I think there's also, and people, I don't think give it enough credit yet. And they will, as we see more mental health issues. Oh yeah. There is so much psychological damage that can happen yeah. with awful managers who mess with people's careers. Mm -hmm. And it's not always intentional. Yeah. It's just a lot of times they don't, they haven't been trained or well, well formed. Yeah. And it can really mess with people. And, and I've yeah. seen a lot of people go through a lot of hard times with managers and I've, I've had my fair share. So to answer Ali's question, um, one of the worst situations I've been in is one where a manager felt so insecure about, you know, their situation in terms of being respected by, you know, the direct reports, mm -hmm. um, not necessarily being an expert in, in what this manager managed, yeah. you know, the kind of work that this manager managed. And, um, and really, I mean, pretty clearly just not well liked, unfortunately. Mm, yeah. Um, so in a lot of ways, you know, I, I could feel bad for, you know, and, yeah, yeah. And, and really feel like, wow, you know, that's got, that's gotta be a tough spot to be in. It's tough being a Karen, right? Right guys? Nothing? Yeah, nothing? you tell them, Edmund. Nothing? Oh man, that yeah. was tough. Yeah. Nothing? Definitely person wasn't a Karen, but <laughs> that was like, <laughs> no, that's like, that's like lingo. Now a Karen is like, is like slang now for like a privileged, a uh, white girl who's like really obnoxious and like it's like a right. None of you have ever heard yeah, that. No, before? Heard of it. Oh, yeah, heard of it. Not oh, really yeah. using it. I'm right. just laughing in my head because this person was not even oh, okay, close okay, to being okay, a character. Okay, okay. um, but my point is, um, unfortunately, that insecurity turned into a, a lot of a lot of manipulation. Mm, yeah, a lot of asymmetric information. Mm. I'll. I, thanks for sharing that with me. I hear you. I understand. No, don't worry. I'll go pass that along to so and so. Oh, and then yeah, and then you don't know how it gets passed along. Yeah, yeah and then yeah. it comes back to you later and find out. Yeah. but that's not what I said at all. Um, and then it just got downright deceitful. It was just lies that's at some rough. point, and it was just a really ugly situation, yeah. um, which involved other people I I knew and was yeah. friends with. Yeah, and it soured our relationships. Um, and it was just a really ugly, toxic yeah. situation. And it, I'm grateful I went through it though, because it's been these, like all these little seeds and all these, and sadly, by the way, Ali, that's not the f one and only time mm. I experienced that kind of manager. Yeah. yeah. It's they're out there. They're out there. And I've, and I've had more than one, well, what I, if I, I think I, close to three. What did it, it's just really unfortunate. And my point is, as much as I've appreciated the companies I've worked for, the companies I've served in terms of uh, having clients, where I'm going with my line of work now and what I want to be doing, and especially who I want to be serving, are creators and yeah. makers. Yeah. And you could be doing it on your own right now and trying to make a living that matters on your own. Or maybe you were like me when I was at these tech companies yeah. daydreaming about, okay, what's my next business idea? What's my next project or side hustle or whatever it is. These creators are in these companies too. And I can't tell you how many people I've talked to for the past decade who say my, my work is soul crushing mm. or it's soul sucking. Like, what are we doing? We are not supposed to be doing soul sucking or soul crushing work. Now, I'm going to clarify right now. I'm not saying everybody should be happy at work and it's the best job ever. And every day I go and, you know, nothing bad happens or nothing mm. wrong. No, you know, nothing goes wrong. That's not what I'm talking about at all. But when you're in those toxic situations, when your environment is not set up in a way where it's maximizing your talents and optimizing for creativity to solve problems creatively and design mm. solutions creatively. And it becomes so mundane that guess what? Artificial intelligence is here. It's mm. not, it's not going away. And I'm not yeah. saying this isn't like some fear tactic around, 
everything's going to get automated and no one's going to have jobs anymore. That's not it at all. But we're moving in this direction as, as, a, as a people, as a society and in humanity. We're moving in this direction where developing and nurturing and forming your creativity, your ability to solve problems creatively mm. is more important than ever. Yeah, it's, indis- it's like the one thing or kind of the one arguably the, the one thing that artificial intelligence can't can't that, replace. I believe yeah. that hundred percent. So what is, what is your advice? I do want to, I think what is your advice to someone? A lot of people might relate to having a manager have like a situation where there is a direct report that is a toxic relationship mm. or you're unhappy with that. It's, I, I think about this a lot cause we homeschool our kids. And so I tell, I joke with my wife all the time that like somebody has to bully our kids. Like somebody, <laughs> like our kids have to learn that there are bullies out there yeah. and how to deal with them. Right. Yeah. And like, I want to, you know, not that I purposely bully my kids, but they're like, w- you know, when some of our kids are fighting or whatever, it's easy as a parent to get all caught up and like, oh, you want your kid to just have an easy life. And it's like, no, they have to deal with bullies because there are bullies in the world and you have to learn how to deal with bullies. The same with, you have to learn how to deal with bad managers or bad direct reports. And That's right. especially in toxic situations or in companies where, there's a direct report and other reports above them that gets even more complicated because it's not as easy as just like go to their direct report. No. Um, but what advice would you give to someone who's like, who, what advice would you have given to yourself about that situation with that manager or that, that direct report or what advice would you give people like, Oh, I mean, I can relate. I'm in a toxic situation with my manager or the person above me quit <laughs> other than quit. Maybe not yet. Yeah. Yeah. Not yet. Yeah. I wouldn't quit yet. You have to assess your situation. You know, that's the that's the caveat I'd have to put out there, right? Like yeah. legally and just out of respect. You have to assess your situation. If you're in something that's really awful, yeah. truly awful, like sexual harassment, like illegal, stuff, illegal abuse, your abuse, yeah, yeah, yeah. any of that, out. Like, I mean, go do what someone, you got to do to yeah, get yeah. safe. That's yeah, my yeah, advice. Yeah. Do whatever you need to do to get safe. But for that middle ground, like the gray area, the, the gray area. Um, so I, I would start by saying, do what my mom taught me to do when I was a kid. I just told my kids this story recently because one of my kids did it to the other. I'm like, well, no, we don't do that. That's not our way. Don't do that. Um, my mom was picking me up from school one day. I don't even remember what grade I was in. I might've been like grade four, or grade five, something like that. And a friend comes up and coming up in the hallway and just playfully comes up to me and grabs me by the shirt, like by the lapels, like this up in the collar. And it's just like, hey, we're gonna play tomorrow. Or I don't even remember what he yeah, said, yeah. something yeah. like that. And like, yeah, let's play. And you know, I, I was, let's just say I was significantly taller th- than this kid. I didn't think of anything of it. I didn't, I didn't mind. My, my mom sees it and she pulls me over to the side as we're you know, heading over to leave the school. And she says to me with the most intense kind of like I'm telling you something you better remember for the rest of your life kind of tone. Oh dude, I've done that to my kids too. Mm-hmm. I know exactly mm-hmm. the face you're, you're yeah. Oh yeah, there's a yeah. face, there's a look. It's like And she said, "Don't you ever let someone grab you by the shirt like that again and treat you like that." <sighs> like nobody touches you like that. It Ooh, it, it was yeah, this yeah. stand up for yeah, yourself yeah, yeah. Yeah, kind yeah. of mm-hmm. kind of advice, right? Mm-hmm. She wasn't mad at me, but it was like a Hey, wait a minute. Yeah, yeah. You have you never dignity. Let someone, yeah, yeah. You yeah. have yeah. No one can take away that dignity from you. You don't let them grab your shirt like that. Yeah. So my advice is the same thing. When you're in a situation like that, and I'll just speak for myself. That's all I can do. You have to assess your situation. At the time, I was trying to rebuild. At that at that point, I was married. Had, we had our first couple kids. And I was trying to rebuild from that second business that didn't end so well. Mm. So we were trying to replenish the yeah. family reserves, trying to yeah. get some savings built back up. So in a lot of ways, I felt like I, it, I, I need this I need job. This I, job. I, I can't yeah. leave, right? And yeah. I haven't even really been here a year, but this is already a sinking ship. This is yeah. awful. The company was fine, but it was, it was the situation that was really bad. Even still, what I'm saying is, if you're in that middle area, you're not you're not in something that's totally abusive. And you 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 know, it's abusive and you need to get to safety. If you're not in that mm-hmm. situation, yeah. you're in this middle ground. What I'm trying to say is don't let anyone treat you that way. Don't mm. let anyone grab you by that by your shirt mm. and mess around with you like yeah. that 
meaning there are other options. Yeah. You, you can seek so many other options in, in employment, even if it's a tough job market, any of that, it's just not worth the mental anguish and the, I was going home stressed out of my mind every single day, mm. headaches, migraines every other week. It was just an awful situation. Um, I got more colds that year and more like colds oh, and flus yeah, and bronchitis. Just cause like anxiety and just, stress. I was just constantly on edge. Yeah. Living for the weekend, like couldn't wait for the weekend just to spend with my family and, um, and everything else actually was pretty cool. I mean, the commute to work was easy yeah. and all these other things were kind of going great. But it, and then there was that Sunday dread, like, mm. oh no, I gotta go into work on Monday and then and deal with this, yeah. right? And kind yeah. of grind through the week. It's unless you are in some very unique situation where there is no other paycheck you can possibly get, yeah. I believe it's not worth it. Yeah. I believe it's not worth it to say. So but but before you quit, you have to assess that, discern that. Yeah. And and really figure out do I need to um, is this something I should be tolerating? Mm. Um, and if not, let me find something else. Yeah. Cause there's the, and I'll help you if you're yeah. in a situation, I'm telling you right now, I'm telling all your listeners and viewers. Oh, there's I'm so gonna, many look, I mean, millions. I know there are millions of people, of people listening millions right of people now listen. watching this to the millions. Look, I'm going to look right in the yeah, camera. Look right to camera. Listen, <laughs> partially joking here, but in all seriousness, I mean this. Sharbo will personally help you. I am serious. If you are, if you are in a situation like what I described and, and you need to get out of it, if I can be helpful in some kind of way to think about different companies to apply for introductions to people who might be hiring at various companies, especially if you're in tech, that's where I have the strongest network. But even if it's not in tech, um, just know, I'm telling you, just know that there are people who are willing to help you find something that is more fulfilling and rewarding and meaningful. And at the very least, even if it's not meaningful, fulfilling work for you, mm -hmm. at least it upholds your integrity yeah, uh, and your dignity. Yeah. Right. So bottom line is um, that situation and unfortunately the, the few others that were really similar, I seem to be like a magnet for this in my career in some way, but magnet I also for, what? for bad situations, for bad situations, for toxic people, um, I guess so. But, <laughs> but that's also a little bit like, I don't want to speak like a, a victim per se. Yeah. It's um, there were a lot of things I didn't know then mm. like how to handle yeah, and how to totally. react. Yeah. When you're young, um, like so I, you I think, could have learned. Yeah. There's so much like I didn't just last year I realized I was at, I was at, uh, so I worked in, in a church in parish ministry and there was a staff room. There was like the staff like break room and it had a fridge in it and it had all these different like condiments and stuff that kind of gathered over the years. And there was stuff that would go bad and blah, blah. And our business, one time our business manager and our secretary were at like the break room, like table. And, um, there was, I was just kind of joking around and there was some crappy stuff in the fridge. And I, and I turned to them and I just like, I just start taking out the old stuff and I just go, Hey, can I throw this away? And they both looked at me and were just like, yeah, you can do whatever. And I, and I started throwing stuff away. And afterwards I realized I still felt like I was a kid in an adult world. Like there was, I still thought that there was some adult somewhere yeah. that like took care of stuff. And, and I thought maybe it was the business manager or the secretary or someone. And they both were like, like basically what I heard in my head was like, no, we're, we just feel like we're kids too. Like there's no adult, <laughs> right, like, right. like everyone looked around the room and was like, Hey, does anyone know if we should? And the business manager, or the secretary were like, no, we mm. don't know. Mm. And I just assumed I'm like freaking 30 years old looking at other people thinking there's a parent or an adult somewhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I realized like, I thought the staff room, there was some rule, like a rule book, like an adult rule book and adults somewhere figured this all out. And I was just walking into the world. Like surely someone has a rule about stuff in the fridge. And I like look around and everyone's like, <laughs> no, we never, there's no rule. Like, no, no one came up with that. No one's taking care of that. Right. So if you want to throw it away, sure. Someone's going to throw it away. And yeah, when you're, when you're younger, like there's so much of that pressure, like, like, man, if I talk, if I speak up to someone, um, the only advice I would give, um, to people that are in that situation that I wish I had been given. And actually Kyle, you are very, very good at this, um, mm. is this idea. So glass canvas is this agency and they have this value. Yeah. I know them well. Yeah. They have this value. Um, speak the unspoken, mm. which is a really good value. Like just say the thing like that's unspoken, but also I heard someone say something similar. It was like, 
just say the weather. And to me, it meant huh. when you tell someone what the weather's like outside, you don't experience any anxiety, any pressure, any emotional tension. Like if, like if you say, Hey, how's the weather outside? I'm like, Oh, it's like 72 degrees. There's no Not thinking, how do I couch this? Yeah, so you they just don't say it. You just say yeah. it. Yeah. Wow. And, and, okay. and, uh, like the advice is when someone says, like if your boss or whoever comes in and says something that like triggers you or makes you upset or you feel like it's really mean mm. to just say the weather, just say it. Wow. That was really mean. Or like, or like, wow, that sounded really mean. Or like, or I just say this. it, just say it. Like, wow, that, that made me feel really upset. You like, and just say it like it's the weather. Kyle, you were really good at this. I don't know if you noticed this, but there's been times we've worked together where you've just like said it so simple. Like you've just said, yeah, I worked on this thing and then nothing ever came of it. And I've been waiting for two weeks for that. And I was like, Shh. it like that level of Kyle, are you, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, no, I, I think it took me a while to get there. I think, uh, Obviously, I'm pretty young. I'm 23. I've only had a real job, quote unquote, for about a year and a half now since I graduated college. But I think it was spending like a year in a job where I felt like there was a lot of just loose end work where we'd have these great ideas. I'm sure that we're not the only company in America that has ideas and doesn't follow through with them. In fact, <laughs> I would say most companies do that. Yeah. But I think what happened with me after the year is that I didn't realize that everybody was like that. And then after about a year of doing it, you know, I get out of the company, but I get out, I mean, laid off COVID and <laughs> I start this new thing. Just, I, I don't know. I just got really frustrated. It's kind of a perfect storm in my life of sort of waking up and sort of growing up in a real way because of this COVID yeah. situation and then leaving the job and realizing that. I don't have to work the job that I started six days after I graduated college for mm. the rest of my life. But where did that come from? That ability to like, you seem maybe from the outside, maybe this isn't true, but from the seems outside, really comfortable. yeah, it seems like you just like, you like, I mean, we've talked about money that way. We've talked about so many things where you're like, yeah, like I, I just don't, I'm not excited about getting paid, you know, $15 an hour basically to work for 30 hours. You know, like there was just, you just seemed from the outside so comfortable saying that. Whereas, if I, when I was your age, I would not have had, I, I was so conflict diverse. I would, Oh avoid my that. gosh, I would, I'd be doing this and not, you know, I wouldn't be breathing out. I'd be like, so it'd be really cool if like we could, you know, like, Kyle, do you know what I'm talking about? Right, yeah, I got a better answer to, okay. that's good. to an event in the pre and the post changed my life. Okay. Because when I was uh, when I was a junior in college, I emceed the Franciscan talent show. Franciscan was pretty small school, but it was me and a buddy of mine, two microphones and about 1500 people there. No pressure. And there were two things, because I remember thinking, I was like, I'm not going to be scared. And then like a couple days where I was like, I'm going to be scared. I, I realized <laughs> that. And I was like, well, there are two ways I can get through this. Because my dad had given me advice about bullies as well that I actually applied into this. He said, when someone's bullying you, Kyle, that means that you're above them and they're below you. And there's two ways they can make it equal. Either they can bring themselves up to your level or they can pull you down. Mm. And he said, it's a lot easier to pull someone else down. That's why bullies grab your shirt. Mm. And I, I thought that made sense. Yeah. And I remember thinking, mm. well, I'm equating this crowd to being above me because <laughs> there was 1,500 of them, which is a pretty fair estimate. They yeah. definitely could have beat me up if we fought. So you imagined them all naked? No, no. I just imagined they were all scrubs. I just uh -huh. remember thinking, I was like, you know what? I I can do this. Like these people, like, come on, what do yeah. they know about emceeing talent shows? None of them's ever done it. So you're saying when you talk to me, you just imagine I'm a scrub? Okay. Yeah. No, it, it. it helps <laughs> me out. <laughs> It's, I don't know if it's the greatest thing for my long-term psyche, yeah. but it's legitimately what I think. So it works, man. I think, you know what? All right, Edmund can do X, Y, Z, and probably A, B, and C better than me, but as long as I can do H, as long as I can do no, this, no, no, no. I, I mean, feel like, good about myself. X, Y, and Z. I think I can do all the other alphabet, but then like you, I'll give you like X, Y, and Z That's better fair. than me. That's fair. I okay. was choosing H because it was the lamest like letter. Like three letters out of the 26, I'll give you. Yeah, but X, Y, and Z are <laughs> don't cool Don't get letters. to like H? Like that's a lot of... I that's just like met pretty, just the letter H. Pretty, I digress. Yeah. But the point is, I remember being nervous and I did it and I felt like I did a good job and Chris Stefanik came up to me afterwards and said, I did great. Mm. And oh, I wow. I remember thinking like, Chris Stefanik's a real name. Wait, this was at Steubenville uh, talent show? Chris Stefanik Yeah, was it was there? the homecoming talent show. Oh, weird. He had a daughter who went to the school and Chris Stefanik Oh, so he like, wasn't like performing. No, no, no. He was just a dad. Oh. And Can you in, imagine Chris Stefanik performing at a talent show? And in retrospect, you know, Chris Stefanik, you know, he's an alumni of the school. He's going there to have a good time. Maybe Maybe it wasn't that big of a deal. Yeah. But at the time, I remember thinking I was really nervous. And this guy who speaks for a living was willing mm. to tell me nice. And whether or whether yeah. or not that was impressive at all, it was impressive to me. Yeah. 
So that just gave me sort of the confidence. Well, man, if Chris Stefanik thinks I can do this, like, how can I, how can I be that? You know, how can so, I do it? Based on this, let's go to current events. We got a bunch mm -hmm. of different current events. And this first one, DoorDash $8 tip. Mm. Talk about, uh, I don't know if you heard about this, but um, let's see. So this story here, talk about confrontation. Oh, it's going to be an ad. You're going to have to mute it. Um, we just uh -oh. had uh -oh. the most ah! amazing Yo, let's pump this ad up. What is this? Uh, Driver man. No, he's Verbo. Verbo.com. Okay. Okay, wait, wait. Pause it real quick. Okay, so this is a like a ring doorbell video recording mm. of a door and and there's two sides to this situation, okay? okay? So I don't know that it's that clear. But so an order was placed, this door dasher shows up and then she starts ringing the thing and then this is what happens. How you can leave it, thank you. She so says you can leave it. Thank you. I'm gonna hang out, stick around. Yeah, I don't know why she's. About she must this. not have heard it. I used to leave it. Oh, no, I can speak to you actually. <laughs> He's like, what? I need to speak to you. I don't think you realize where they're coming from, so I need to speak to you. You can see her. She's like pumped up. Where the food you ordered is coming from. I don't think you realize the distance that it's come from because then you would never actually have given what you gave. So she's upset. I think you can oh, come and see face to face. So she wants me. I drove 40 minutes. I drove 40 minutes and it was extremely far and I got it to you early. So I don't think you realize where you work from. Mother. I'm not, I don't understand. Um, you well, I think from where? From the restaurant that you ordered from. She is. Do you realize how far it is? Do you realize you ordered from Carmack and you're in Smithtown? That's a, that's a 15, 20 minute drive. It's not. You need to try to drive it. I just drove it. It's 40 minutes. It's, it's 12 and a half miles. So I don't think you realize how far it is. So he left an $8 tip. So he leaves an $8. Is this the whole? So he leaves an $8 tip. She's upset. She's very upset. She's clearly upset. And then she says. How much is the tip? You gave an $8 tip. What the hell are you looking for? He's like, what are you looking for? I'm going to bring the food back. I'm going to bring the food back. So she takes the food. I'm going to bring the food back. She's so upset. So apparently, so based on his reaction, you don't know the total, right? right? But DoorDash automatically, the lowest you can give, I think, is 15. I think the lowest you can give is 15, and then there's 15, 20. Okay, you can turn it off. So, like, we don't know what the total is, but based on his reaction, like, he assumes $8 is, like, a pretty fair tip. Right. And he ordered, and he basically tells her at one point, why did you take the order? Like, if you knew how far it was, why did you right. take the... So what I want to get everyone's, what's your reaction, Adrian? So apparently you don't know how far the order is. Yeah. So you just like click. Well, I mean, it says, exactly. it says like how many minutes it will take to get to you, but yeah. you're not really scrolling through going, oh, I better not order from this restaurant. Yeah, true. But I want, when I was working today, I was like, I was, I didn't eat lunch. I was like, I'm super hungry. So I, I was on DoorDash. I was like, all right, let me see how much Chick-fil-A is going to be for the DoorDash right here. Yeah. Grapevine. $20 order. I didn't order it, but I saw it was 40 minutes for mm. the order, but I was like, it's right here. Yeah. But I understand it takes a while and all that. So maybe it was just, maybe it was closer. Maybe it was just really busy because yeah. it takes a while for the order to get in. They got to go there, get the order, especially if it's a pop-in restaurant, maybe yeah. it's lunchtime. So there's two sides of the story. Is the $8 tip fair? I mean, it's kind of like, I mean, if it was a $5 item or if it was like a $10 item, yeah. And you have to drive 40 minutes. That's just part of DoorDash, right? Like, yep. I mean, I can't imagine though DoorDash, like you, like a driver having to drive 40 minutes. Like, doesn't sound right. That doesn't sound right. Doesn't sound right. No. So it's, I don't like delivery systems for that reason, just because yeah. I think it's super flawed. It doesn't really benefit anyone. Doesn't benefit restaurants. Doesn't, yeah. doesn't, doesn't benefit drivers. The people that order the food, it usually comes cold sometimes. So yeah. it's kind of just like Kyle. What do you think? Eh, and it's overpriced for sure. I'm I'm very pro delivery services personally. 
I love doing it. I but think do you think great. who do you think like is in the right or wrong no, in this situation? Absolutely, the guy who ordered the food's in the right. Really, I mean, in the right or the wrong? He's in the right. Okay. I think. Look on DoorDash specifically. My understanding, based off I read an article, one article, not extensive research, is that it shows you the tip before you do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. You you select like 15, 20, 30. Right. Like, and you just you just select it. Now, to be fair, I don't like that system because I will change my tip based off of the service I receive. Meaning, not so much now that I live in a house, but when I lived in an apartment, I would usually say, "Hey, could you come to my door?" Yeah. And if they managed, to, and that was difficult, they had to park and walk up. If they managed to do that, I would tip a lot more. Yeah. But if they would just call me and said, "Hey, I'm not coming up," then I'd still tip. But yeah. like you're not gonna get the same. It was more of a boost than a. There was still a floor. I think she's totally in the wrong. But, I don't know, Charvel. Who's whose side are you? Hold on, on? I, got, I got one more point. Okay, here. go for it. So this lady, first of all, she's talking about forty minutes, twelve miles to forty minutes. That doesn't add up. That's rough. That you haven't you haven't lived in L.A. Man. I yeah, I mean, unless downtown LA. L.A. or I'll something. I'll give you guys a point there. But I, I don't think it was in L.A. Was no, it? I don't know where. But no, I'm just yeah. saying, like, I mean, unless it's a very yeah. intense like rush hour or something. Uh. Okay, let's queue up the next event. But I think, Sharper, what do you think? Whose side are you on? You got to pick a side. I got you have <laughs> gas to. or pass. Yeah, gas or pass. <laughs> then, one last point. Yeah. Tips to me, I've worked in the restaurant industry for years, not five yeah. years. The way I see it, it's always appreciative, never expected. Mm. So you should never expect, I deserve a $20 tip, right? Yeah. Hey, it's a shitty job one day. Okay, maybe the next person you get, yeah. it's a 10 minute drive, but your tip's $20. That's, yeah, like, that's where I'm at. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. You, it's, it's a gamble. You got a bad tip. You move just, on, that's part of the, the game. Driver. It's so, part of the game. Like, so to circle back what you said earlier, yeah. she's a Karen. Yeah. That's 100% a Karen. That's yeah, yeah. a Karen. That's a Karen. Like, expecting, like, I deserve more. Like, do you? Like, yeah. maybe you do, maybe you don't, but always you know, appreciate you know it. Uh, you know what I'm a way more softy for? Like, if she would have rang it and been like, honey and not vinegar like if she would have been like gave a sob story been like look i'm a single mom like i drove 40 minutes i didn't realize like but would you consider a better tip no pr you know something like that i i, I would have given her 50 bucks i would have like I don't, here you I, go I, i'm sorry i think there's something in the middle where it's not would you consider and sob yeah. story it's it's tell them the weather mm. hey here's look, the situation you know i I, had I, think, to pay this I think I went the extra mile, yeah. quite literally, pun yeah. intended, whatever you want to say. And I'm surprised about an $8 tip. That's a fair, you know, that's a fair point. You know, I, I think something more like 12 for this order would have been more fair. Yeah. Are you willing to do that? Yeah. yeah. And, it, and I think that way it's, hey, I'm, I'm coming at you. And this is, look, th this could take us down a rabbit hole. This is exactly what's wrong with everything in the world today. <laughs> DoorDash, so, DoorDash drivers, DoorDash drivers. You heard it no, here first. It's our inability yeah. to talk, come together, and and speak on some kind of level to say, yeah. I disagree with X. I would prefer Y, or yeah. here's where I think it's wrong, and this is where I think it's right. And, yeah, yeah. As opposed to coming at it like, no, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna give you a piece of my mind. It's yeah. Like, yeah. Whoa, hold on. If we're coming at it already on fire, as yeah. opposed to let's let's hear each other out. Yeah. Hey, and and if look, you're not gonna decide to change your tip on me. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, at least I said my piece. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At least I did my part. I want to give a shout out to Edmundo. You know Edmundo, yeah. right? Yeah. He uh he does this often where he will he will say, Look, you know, I wanna say some things of what I'm seeing on my side, and then I wanna give you an opportunity to respond. And then he will like kind of say it kind of really bluntly, like I perceive this, 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 and this, and here's some things I'm thinking or some options. We met. Now I want to give you an opportunity to kind of respond to that. Maybe, that. maybe I'm off base. And I, yeah, I really respect that too. All right. What's our next current event? Uh, we got Facebook removing likes from pages. Snapchat yeah. What do you think on this Charbel? So Facebook remove is, uh, I think they have done this already, or they're going to do this. I thought this was already done. Well, well so like, I, I knew it wasn't, but like, I knew they were testing it. Instagram, Instagram, testing Instagram was right. testing removing likes from uh, from the platform, which they've kind of started to do. They kind of hid it a little bit, but Facebook is getting rid of likes, which has always been kind of weird because really you're liking it because you're trying to follow it, and now it's just followers. Anyways, I'm just wondering. Uh, well, there's a confusing piece about the early days yeah. where you were a fan yeah. of a page or you're following then it, it became your following, yeah. but you also like it. That's confusing. I think likes are, are the, just keep in mind a little bit of context. Um, Orkut was the very first social media app I worked on. Yeah. Um, prior to that, you know, Friendster was the big deal. Uh, MySpace, right. Facebook was emerging 
It was is emerging and becoming more and more popular. Um, and then clearly took the reins right mm -hmm. from MySpace and, and Friendster. Yeah. Um, Orkut was an attempt from Google unofficially is what they would always say. Yeah. Um, and then of course comes along later, you know, Twitter and so on. Likes is just pure vanity metrics mm. that just mess with your yeah. sense of yeah. self and mm -hmm. ego and, yeah. and worth. Mm -hmm. They're pointless. Yeah. They're literally pointless. Yeah, yeah. I agree with the caveat though, that there's some, like what it really represents now is some type of like transaction. It's like the new, it's like a new currency. Like it is vanity. Yes. Like you shouldn't worry about it. But I do give like, like I do follow or whatever we want to call it. Like yeah. Facebook pages changing it to follow, right? Like right. there's some type of, I want, like when you like a Facebook page, you're not just saying like, good job. You're saying, I want to hear more about this. And I think, I wonder if that's where they're starting to try to like diverge off into is what, is, what we're really looking for is I want to follow the, it's like the newsletter, right? It's like subscription. But to the point though, that they're making following is saying, I am interested in giving you my yeah, attention. Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying affirmation. Way to go. Yeah, yeah exactly. affirmation. Exactly. It's, I, I'm giving you my attention. Yeah. I'm not affirming mm -hmm. anything. The problem with the general like, the yeah. general like button or double tapping Instagram, et cetera, is it's a that transaction, the like is the currency, mm -hmm. if you will. Mm -hmm. And there's no gold behind that yeah. currency. Yeah. There are no gold bars in the vault. Mm -hmm. It's such a passive form of currency. All I need to do is just as I'm scrolling, just rhythmically bring my thumb yeah. down and tap it and move on. Yeah, yeah. Engagement is what matters so much more. The posts that I put out that get three likes, but 10 comments, I'll take that all day long. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. As opposed to 100%. 82 likes, but no one said anything. I'm like, well, great. You, it, it somehow got your attention to stop yeah. long enough to like it, but, yeah. but interact, I think, right? I think, interact we're, I think we're, become, we're going to become smarter and smarter with this as influencer marketing becomes more and more of a thing because they're finding that the massive followings are not, don't have as high engagement as like the medium, the medium micro audiences. So like often, you know, millennial moms that have two to 5,000 followers are like get have a uh, way higher like audience loyalty. Like they trust, they trust mm -hmm. that person way more mm -hmm. than like paying for Kim Kardashian just to do a post. Right. Like you're going to get the volume, but like you're saying, you don't get the engagement or the trust level. Right. So like with micro uh, marketing for me, when I look for models to collaborate with brands, I don't find models that like have the most amount of likes, right? Cause it's mainly just, okay. They're just likes. you find models or just people who have high comments. Yeah. Cause I mean, it just shows that people really do care about it. Right. And you got to look through the comments and make oh, sure it's not just like fire yeah, and like fire, fire emoji, fire, fire emoji. Collab, like, yeah. yeah, yeah are you, collab. Are you DM for, for collab? Yeah, are you looking for sugar daddy? You're just yeah, like, yeah, no, yeah, get yeah. that stuff out of there. Dude, the DM for collab is the worst. Yeah. I hate that. And like, but or the stuff where it's like really like your page. Yeah. So yeah. it's, that's what I'm always looking for. So yeah, when yeah. I look on hashtags, I see like a cool girl. I'm like, okay, cool. Followers this much likes. Mm. Yeah. But the comments are crazy. Yeah. Let's look at the comments. Mm -hmm. Oh, they really like care really about their girl's stuff. personality. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Perfect. Let me hit her up. She seems fun to work with. Yeah, I'm actually awesome. working with someone this Sunday because yeah. of that tactic. Yeah, deep engagement always wins. Um hundred percent. Let's go to the next let's what's our next current event? We got Snapchat permanently banning Donald Trump. Okay, Sharp, right. we'll give your advice while I go pee. Okay. Or give your take. I just have a clarifying question. Was he even on Snapchat? So it was more so for memes. So I was curious. So I deleted Snapchat a while ago, but while I had Snapchat, I was like, does the president have a Snapchat? And this was during when, you know, the race was happening. It was just memes, straight shit posting, just straight memes about Joe Biden, the coffin dance with like the Biden, N nothing serious, maybe like 5% serious, but while, like, you look at it for the memes okay? because Snapchat's target demographic is teens. Mm. Teens, people in high school, people in college, maybe oh, a little pe after college. People who can't vote, you mean? Yeah, <laughs> right. basically. So it was just shit posting memes. <laughs> like nobody watched it. I was like, oh, that's pretty funny. Like I'm, I'm gonna go vote for this guy now. You, you watched it to be like, all right, what did this guy do today? Right. And 100, percent it was just right. memes. And there be some memes. I'm like, I have friends that didn't like Trump, and I was just like, so Trump was posting on Snapchat. Yeah, it was just memes. It was shit posting. Memes. Man, that's crazy. And like, yeah, that's I, crazy to I, imagine. Yeah, I'm indifferent about the entire politics, all that. But like, just it was just funny. It was yeah. original content. Yeah. Whenever have you ever seen a president 
go on a social media to shit post it's crazy. another guy. It's so crazy. I mean, I I kind of veer towards the is Facebook and are Facebook and Twitter and some of these platforms starting to become more of a utility that like the mm. public has a right to. But Snapchat, I mean, that's kind of tough to say that that's a utility that people have a right. I mean, mm. I don't know. No, of I all the platforms, I'd be like, <laughs> ah, I don't know about Snapchat, but that's pretty crazy. We're gonna have to go a little faster here. So, did you give your take already? On did you give your take while I was peeing on Snapchat banning Trump? Uh, I didn't give my take. I was just wondering. Does he, he have was a Snapchat? Yeah, I know, <laughs> right? right? Yeah, that's pretty wild. Okay, Google purchases Fitbit. I thought this is interesting. What do you Whoa, think about this? I didn't catch this. So Google trying to make a wow. play, maybe for like a watch play here, like the Fitbit. Um, interesting. Google it's not also, surprising. Yeah, but, it, but so I didn't hear this yet. Google also has these. Uh, um, they have the buds or something like they're doing their own version of like the AirPods as well. Which is These are the ones crazy. that translate. I think they can almost yeah, do real time yeah, yeah, translation. Yeah, yeah. Real time yeah. translation, is, which is wild. Right. Um, right. Do you like AirPods? Do you use AirPods at all? I do, but I lost them. Oh, one of my kids lost one of them. Yeah, that's then the I just worst. hung on to the, the second one. Yeah. Then we lost the charger. <laughs> then we lost the second one. I had I had over. just one for the long I had the first AirPods. Yeah. Uh, and then I had one for the longest time because I lost the other one. And my then, issue was they didn't they never fit. They didn't oh, fit my ears. okay. Well yeah. the new the pros have like extra yeah. fittings yeah. so you can all right, what's next? Um we got Elon Musk passes Jeff Bezos as the richest that's person. That's right. I did in catch this world. headline. Yeah, and then um, Elon also talking about someone who like shit posts and stuff. Uh, he uh, on Twitter was just Doesn't like, "Oh, did I? Well, back to work or something like that." Like his <laughs> comment was just like, I "Well, I like the guy. I like him too." How I, strange. I, well, back to work. He doesn't yeah. care. Yeah, he's he's on a mission. Yeah. That's what I respect about the yeah. guy. What does he care about whether he passed Bezos or not? Do you think he's the mo like this is the most overinflated stock in the history of the stock market? Like Elon Musk, or like Tesla stock, and some of these things. Not at all. I think uh -huh. I don't I don't I won't speak to the economics of it, but he's yeah. He's becoming an iconic innovator. Yeah. In, uh, this in our era. Is he Iron Man? Is he the real Iron Man? I think he's got a couple more years to prove that. <laughs> but, uh, but, but on Tesla stock, have you guys heard of r slash Wall Street bets on Reddit? Reddit? No. It is the most great. So think of a bunch of college students who just graduated. Yeah. Who have a bunch of money and like. Yes, F, F it all in on Tesla today. So I saw it's insane. I saw wow. a guy on something like that on yeah. Reddit where he put in a hundred grand like a couple years ago or something, <laughs> and now his stock is worth I think it's like two point eight million or something. So he posted Hello. he posted his bank account yeah. like and he he said like his buy in was a hundred grand and then made out with two and a half million or something like yeah, that. Yeah, if you ever want to like see like like risky like times like like it's just gonna boil your blood. Go on Wall Street bets. Yeah, just scroll and hear, like, yeah. read some of these stories. It's all people that won, right? Like, no, no, that is no, no, totally no, 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 false. No, 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 no. It's oh, lots really? of losers. It's lots people losers. Oh, okay. It's people like, hey, should I go all in on this bet? They're like, do it. And then a lot of <laughs> option <laughs> trading. On yeah, it. and then update. Uh, my wife divorced me. Oh no! <laughs> no, no. And, yeah. and like people are just like f like no chicken tendies today. If you ever want a good time, <laughs> just go for it. It is in so stupid. So how much is Jeff Bezos? Or no, how much is Elon Musk worth now? What does this say in the article? Uh, let me go, let me hop back. It's got to be trillions, right? Or we're like the wealthiest no. people in the world are in trillions, right? No one is. No one's No one is a trillion. in trillions no. on paper. No? One hundred eighty-seven bill. Wow. A hundred and eighty-seven billion. But there are That's two insane. important stock tips from Wall Street Bets that everyone should know. Number one, <laughs> stocks only go up; they don't go down. They go on sale. <laughs> That's really important. <laughs> Number two, you only lose money once you sell. So jot that uh, down. I also want to look straight to camera and say uh, none of this is actual financial. Please consult your local yeah. financial yeah, you advisor. Have the yeah, the disclaimer. Please yeah. don't follow. This. All right, what are the current events? We got to get through some of these. All right, let's I put see. too many here. Yeah, we have a con. Uh, oh, okay. Based on okay, stocks. We're talking about stocks. Yeah. Go to this link here. Yeah. And uh, it's talking about Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And this was an article about how like all these different trends that are saying that Bitcoin is inflating. Mm -hmm. One is uh, the fake or well the 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 joke digital Doge coin. coin Doge coin is like inflating, even though it was a joke. Like people started as a joke, and now it's one hundred sixty three percent up. Like okay, so watch this. So 
this is like saying like the Bitcoin advice, all this stocks this and crazy advice. Yeah, it's just so intense. It's the just pump. always guys respect the pump. Uh, I respect the pump in all assets. Why? Because it's kind of like karma. You know, the power of the pump always comes back to you <laughs> if you respect the pump of other people. It's it's crazy, but I have this belief that whatever pumps you have to pay respect. Because otherwise, if you're like, oh my god, this 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 scam coin, this scam coin is pumping again. Actually, you are kind of rejecting. You're rejecting the pump from your life. <laughs> Maybe it's a bit out there, you know, woo woo, but uh, <laughs> we, we all gotta believe in something. And I do believe in the power of the pump. It's kind of like, you know, let the pump be with you. I went to bed yesterday, I told you guys on Twitter. I told you guys on Twitter, uh, good night and let the pump be with you, okay? This is how I see, uh, it's it's like this force. It's like this force that is So he's like, he must be and like day are, trading really Bitcoin or something? Mm. Your like different account. types of bit Bitcoin? Always yep. gets I just love, I wanna, Kyle, can we clip out later? Why? Can, you, can we clip out him saying, do not, do not reject the pump from your life? <laughs> day trading is crazy, that's wild. This is really wild. Like, yeah. and, and the Twitter quote for those of you listening at home is, or the quote that went along that someone retweeted this is, people pay to listen to this. So he's like trying to give financial Bitcoin advice, I guess. Respect the pump. Isn't that I don't crazy? know. I learned a lot from that video. What did you learn, Kyle? To respect the freaking pump, man. That's huge. <laughs> is he saying pump or pump? pump. He's no, saying pump. pump. Like when people, it's like this trend, people will try to get everyone to like buy this dude, whatever mm. the flavor of the month is. Okay. So, that and so way, they're trying to ride in like pump. day trade the pumps on some of these different Bitcoin, okay. different types of Bitcoins. Or doing, what, are the, what's, what's, what is it called? Bitcoin is the brand. But what's cryptocurrency. 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 That's right. right, yeah, right. Yeah. So you have a cryptocurrency take for us? No. I, my take is, don't invest in something you don't understand. Yeah, yeah. Do you, do you guys remember that story where, was it 50 Cent didn't realize that one of his contracts on some album was um, that he would get paid in Bitcoin? Really? And he didn't realize, and, he, and like I think 10 years went by, and then he checked on some account, and he had like made $5 million or something. <laughs> It was just like from small, like some contract I did 10, not hear this. yeah, some contract like 10 or 15 years ago had like a little disclaimer that like 1% or something could come of sales wow. could be distributed in Bitcoin in his name. And so like 10 or 15 years later, someone tells him, Hey man, you got this account of Bitcoin. Do you want to check it out? And it was worth like freaking $5 million or something. Did you hear about That's the dude with the Bitcoin on the secured hard drive? No. There's this guy, he's got about $200 million worth of Bitcoin. He bought it a long time ago, like right when it becomes a thing, you know, whatever, bought a couple of Bitcoins and he has it on this hard drive and they make these hard drives where you can only have 10 tries to put in the wrong password and it locks forever, right? Huh. So we've all heard of these hard drives and this guy is trying to get into it because it has the Bitcoins on it, like the hash key or whatever it's called, but he only has two guesses left. Can you imagine the stress? That, that is a lot of is stress. In? Because at any point he could get that right and boom. Two hundred eighty-three million. Couldn't you bring that to someone though to un like to jailbreak it or something or like unlock it? I don't know. That's what I was assuming, but it sounded like it was like a real enterprise grade deal. Okay, I want to just let's skip to Edmund's startup idea from two thousand sixteen. I thought this was Ooh. apt. I thought this was apt. Yep. Yeah. I want to get your I want to get your feedback. Why don't we start with this? This is breaking news. I know, right? So this is in two thousand sixteen. So let me pitch it to you. I'll read it to you, Sharble. You give me your Shark Tank. Yes. Okay. All right. So this is in two thousand sixteen. I posted my startup idea. Just wanted to run my elevator pitch for a startup. Danielle Mitchell, my wife, and I started looking for some investors. Here's the pitch draft. My name is Edmund Mitchell. I'm a part of a two-person startup out of Fort Worth, Texas that creates human persons on a yearly basis. We launch them as babies as a minimal viable product, and then we expand from there. About a nine-month turnover after the initial brainstorming session. <laughs> Our business model is to spend 18 plus years of personal coaching with these human persons, lifetime clients, hoping that once we get too old to work, they'll welcome us into their homes and feed us. So the idea is like, we're gonna create the clients and give so much to them that maybe some of them, when they get old enough and go off into the world, will then pay us back dividends, right, right? Right. If we make enough of them, right, our client, those clients could realistically financially support us on a monthly fee or some type of like licensing deal or something I'm thinking at an affordable cost for each of them. Our unique selling proposition is that we hold majority ownership of their genetic material. And we're planning on an IPO later this year once our oldest turn, once the oldest client turns maybe four. Um, 
our target demographic, so the type of clients we're gonna try to create <laughs> from these brainstorming sessions, which by the way, we can have about once a month-ish for the brainstorming sessions, gotcha. me and my wife. Right. Um, and our biggest competitors will probably be our clients, friends, parents. Oh, uh, uh, so the clients we're trying to create are attractive, smart, funny, insightful, young, male or females with a passion for life and thrive to work and, and respect their parents as well. Yeah. Um, so sometimes we dabble in education, maintenance, janitorial services. So that's kind of the startup idea your thoughts, Charbel. Uh, I think it's a good one. I think I think I'm young. I'm fecund. I think over the course of my life, I mean, now I have five of these that I've started up. Um, I mean, I think it could churn out one a year until I'm what, like fifty, like one child a year. Yeah. Look, all I can think about <laughs> is how I would design a sprint for this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering. Let me tell you, those brainstorming sessions are intense. Yeah, yeah. I can imagine. Yeah, can imagine. don't don't imagine them. <laughs> Thank you. I, I'm glad I have your permission to. This not came up in them. my like Facebook like memories thing. <laughs> it's probably not as funny as I think it is. If if I read that, I'd be like, this guy's insane. <laughs> <laughs> That's so like the reaction I get on the most of the stuff I do on social media. Have you had you read that before you agreed to work in the studio? <laughs> no, this is the first time he saw that. Yeah, he how, should have read that first before you. Googled. How are you feeling right now? <laughs> I'm, I am. I'm thinking to myself, why didn't I do a Facebook search? This right. Guy before yeah. I accept, why didn't I do my due diligence yeah, on this guy? Just like I need to character. speak the unspoken right now. <laughs> <laughs> this is really makes me really uncomfortable. Um, we have a voicemail that got sent in. Let's maybe play that voicemail. And I do have to answer the question: What's the perfect oh. ratio between mayonnaise? Okay, and go for that. Who sandwich? submitted that one? This is my fr here. Let me pull it up. This is. Also, just Part to remind everyone yes. who's listening, you can call in to the show, 817-527-1423, and leave a voicemail. What? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're going to play a voicemail. You've got a legit setup here, man. I know. No this one is... listens, but we got a lot of... No, no, we yeah, got the it's, tech. It's all here. I'm no, looking no, no, we got all the tech. You don't understand. Millions of people, millions of people are watching listen. right now. Yeah, yeah. Millions yeah. of people. Uh, this is from my friend, Mari V. Mari V, also part of Catholic Creatives. Nice. And... Because I said we're going to be talking about design, creativity, entrepreneurship, and making sandwiches, mm -hmm. she asked, what is the perfect mayo to mustard ratio? Okay. Do you make sandwiches? I Do you I, take them? I, I need I'm to know. Really Do you good. take sandwiches seriously? Oh, very seriously. Like, I was known as the guy that was really good at making like good food out of cafe out of like the college cafeteria. Like we, I can, we, we really are the same person. Yeah. It's weird. Yeah. yeah. It it's actually really is weird. very strange. It's yeah. Really weird. Um, so I'm really into sandwiches, although trick question kind of for me, because both mayo and mustard, I did not appreciate until I was an adult. Okay. I thought it was gross. Same here. Also cold meat, like, like cold meats had to be, had to be, it had to be warm. It had, had to be, be heated. Yep. We, yeah. our dad traveled the world. I think we had the same dad. <laughs> <laughs> I think we we're the same person. You know, there, okay, so what's there your... are Lebanese people who have fairer skin. So there you go. Yeah. Are there any Mitchells? Are there any like Mitchells in your family line? Never heard of that. Okay. No. Uh, so what is the correct mayo to mustard ratio in your opinion? This is the answer. <laughs> and I'm not, I promise I'm not trying to skirt the answer. Okay. You've got to know your customer. <laughs> oh, that's a good you've got to know good, your customer. that's an on-brand response if i have to mm -hmm. if i have to make these sandwiches at scale and, or be known for something like oh they've got the perfect ratio it's it's not depends on the sandwich though i Does think every sandwich need mayo and mustard not necessarily yeah, yeah. not necessarily but if you are going to put a mayo mustard on a sandwich i think you have to know your other ingredients mm -hmm. so do you need more fat yeah like, do, the, do the ingredients if it's Let's say it's their sauerkraut and pastrami yeah, in there. Yeah, sauerkraut. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. you've already got the acidity and the punch from the sauerkraut. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I'd go a little less. Less on the mustard, mustard. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. I'd agree. Bump up the fat on the mayo a little. Now, bit. Now, are you a like straight up yellow mustard, or are you like the honey or the um like spicy Brown honey mustard? mustard. I'm, I'm just pro mustard. I'm You're open. Pro I'm mustard. open to different mustards. Okay, cool. Some require you know a little bit of that grain and bite. Yeah. Others, I just want to go. So straight you're yellow. like welcome the mustard in. Like let's Any not kind of build mustard. a wall between us and the mustard. Well, like open Any arms. and all mustard. Okay. All, all right. right. So I have some insight about this question. My father grew up in oh, what was it? A mustard so, farm. So, somewhere in LA. Grew up <laughs> on a mustard farm. Yeah. Yeah. So he grew. He was grew out there somewhere. just collecting the mustard like and the mashing, seeds. It, mashing it. Together, He's stepping on it in the mustard barrels. Yeah. So he would go to this liquor mart. And this guy made ham and cheese sandwiches. Just white bread, ham and cheese, 
mayo mustard. That's it. Mm. For like 30 cents back then, right? Yeah. He took us like three years ago to like, oh, this is where I grew up at. And he showed us this liquor mark. Oh, I wonder if it's the same guy. Go in there. It's the guy's son. Whoa. He's like, ham and, ham and cheese sandwiches? Yeah, three of them. So we're sitting there on the curve, drinking like our Mountain Dew, whatever. Takes a bite. Still perfect. Really? Never change. The ham and cheese ratio, the mustard and mayo, never change. That's why it's important to have a process. In <laughs> Pasadena, California. Absolutely. That's yeah, why it's yeah. important. In Pasadena, California, that is. I heard there's a Pasadena, Texas. Oh, yeah, there is. Cool. Pasadena, <laughs> California. You got to go to Roma Market. Hmm. Roma Market is this tiny. It, it's. Yep. You know what I'm talking about. I know what you're talking about. You know what? You've been there? Yeah. Awesome. Dang. I'll, I'll, I'll let you say the story. Tell me. No. I'll, tell me about Rosario, man. Rosario is one of the coolest cats you're ever going to know. Hmm. He's. I'm not even going to guess what how old he is, but he's he's up there. Mm hmm. And he said something like, I don't know if he said 50 years or something, but he's been making the same sandwich Dang. every day. He says he gets up at four in the morning and he makes 200 some sandwiches. He said, Dang. The same sandwich recipe his mom taught him. That's a sacred sandwich. And it's the most, just, it's bellissimo. Can I, can I, can, bellissimo. I, can, I bellissimo. can I blow your guys' mind on condiments? And I actually, this, this is what makes this story worse and better at the same time is I got this advice <clears throat> listening to a podcast. I think Tim Ferriss mentioned it on some weird thing in like 2012 mm. and I tried it and it's amazing. Okay. Hamburger. When you make a burger at home, mm -hmm. you toast the bun, you do lettuce, onion, tomato, you know, maybe mayonnaise, but on the top bun, top bun, toasted bun, almond butter, I'm telling you. If you guys come over to my house and we make burgers, I will have you try it. It is so freaking good. I, I've seen something about yeah, the almond butter, yeah. the umami taste yeah, and yeah. the meat. It's like, it's amazing. Like I've seen it done with peanut butter too. Oh yeah. It's so freaking yeah, yeah. good. I'm intrigued. At first I was like, mm, I don't know, but so I'll make I'll, a burger I'll and I'll split it into a bunch of, and then we can yeah, all yeah. like taste a, okay. Okay. Let's go to our voicemail here. We got a voicemail. Yeah. This is from Ryan O'Hara. I believe it's from oh. Ryan O'Hara from SPO and the internet. You got an LTFT. Long time, hey, first time, time, first time. Show. Um, long time listener, first time caller. There you go. Uh, it's Ryan here. Um, so I went to a liberal arts college and got a degree in history. But what the heck is that for? Uh, 25 years later, I still don't know. <laughs> uh, so I wonder about you guys. Um, if you're going to do college, oh, did you guys go to college? Yeah. Did I, we go I to think. college? Okay. Yeah. Um, sure. You went to college, right? But, Pretty sure I did. Yeah, I did. Um, if you're going to do it over, like what major do you choose? Do you go to the same college? Do you do the same major? Do you do a different major? This is what the people are looking for, and I want to know this. Peace. Thank you, Ryan. Wow. Long time listener, first time caller. Wow. Sharbel, college, yay, nay. Especially advice for people considering going to college. Right. I'll go first, actually. Good. So I was a high school. Youth, I was a middle. <laughs> it was a middle. I was a middle school and high school youth minister, and. I gave the worst college advice. I would tell, like people would ask me, call, I think I even gave Kyle this advice too. I said, look, man, I'm not gonna give you the advice your parents are gonna wanna hear. I just have to be honest. I think most people, the majority of people that graduate high school should not go into college because you have no clue what you wanna do. You don't understand money. You don't understand the financial debt you're getting into. You have no clue. Like the idea now looking back that I went into a Sick that I that me and my parents went into like a six figure debt mm. contract situation, and the first year of that, I had no clue what I was there for. Is crazy. Like, at least go to a community college, like, break out of the system. That's from an old world, like, that used to be valuable. I say my advice is go try to live on your own, work a crappy job intern like crazy like intern opportunities are so much easier to get like shadowing intern like email the ceos of companies you want to work for and decide if you even want to do the job you might be interested in i went to biomedical or i went to uh, georgia tech for biomedical engineering for the first two and a half years for biomedical engineering two and a half years in i had no clue what a biomedical engineer did i didn't even know what they looked like mm -hmm. i didn't even know what types of companies they really necessarily worked in and then I started like seeing what they actually do two and a half years in, right? Like thousands of dollars later. And I'm like, no, I don't want to do this. 
like complete waste of time. Should have just went, worked a job, fi figured out the value of money, like get out from under my parents, get on my own, work a crappy job, realize the stuff I don't want to do. Just experiment, not experiment, <laughs> don't like experiment with drugs, but like, just like go have lots of experiences. Like I really respect, you know, you said in one of your videos, Adrian, like, how often in my life am I going to be able to not have kids, not have a wife and be able to just travel? And like, if I, if you want to live in New York f next year, you can, yeah. well, I mean, COVID pending, but like, if you want to go live somewhere. So my advice is I don't think for very, unless you absolutely know you want to be a lawyer and you want to get started young or you can get a scholarship. Um, that's my advice. Like, I wish I would have taken a little more time to figure stuff out and dude at, if I would have went into college at, 20 even instead of 18. Oh my gosh. I would have crushed college. Like I would have absolutely crushed. Mm. Like you see adults mm -hmm. now, like, like when you, like now, if I were to try to go back and do college all over again, I mean, like straight, straight A's. A's. <laughs> Like Kill it. valedictorian, oh, oh, valedictorian, like you, like ASP president, or whatever. oh, friends with everybody, <laughs> like hanging out with the professors, like totally different experience. Yeah. 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 What do you think Charvel? I agree with a lot of what you said. I think if you're, if you are unprepared and uncertain about what you're about to go into and all you understand is the status quo or conventional wisdom of yeah. you go to college, you get some good grades and you're teed up for a job afterward after you get a degree, yeah. then you're going for the wrong reasons. Yeah. If you're going and you have the opportunity to go and you, you, have some financial aid or, you know, you're not, you're maybe your, your family can't afford it yeah. and it's not a burden on you. Um, or you have that burden lifted in some kind of way. I was very fortunate to, to have that weight off my family's shoulders. Um, then my advice is study as much and as wide as you possibly can Yeah, and explore. Yeah various topics and, and disciplines as much as you can. Mm -hmm. So you can figure out what are the two to three that you want to cross over. Yeah. If you can figure out two to three topics that cross over, you start to create, some people call this like a personal monopoly. Mm -hmm. um, I just like to think of it as you start to continue to lay down the bricks mm -hmm. of your, your, your future of yeah. like who you are. Yeah. So for me, I was, I was always fascinated by psychology. It was my favorite course in, in high school. I put down that I wanted to study it in college. That was, I was entering, you know, college as that is my major and everybody, you know, just didn't get it. Like what, why do you want to do psychology? Like, what would you even do? And why don't you become a doctor? And like, everybody had an opinion. Everybody else had an opinion mm -hmm. about what I should be. Mm -hmm. And at some point I just let too many of that, too many of those voices get into my head. Yeah. So I didn't really understand what studying psychology even meant. Mm. I, in my intro courses, they were so theoretical that I just thought, wait, this isn't what I like. Why, yeah. why, is, this, why is this all theory, right? Yeah. Um, what I didn't understand is, okay, that's just the foundation, but then we're going to get into the more practical matters. We get mm -hmm. into studies, get into, yeah. and how could I mix maybe psychology with what I was doing? I was a track and field athlete. So how do I mix psychology? with athletics hmm. and economics or business. Yeah. That would have been a very interesting intersection between those three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I was of the of the limiting mindset that it had to be one thing and then you had to go become yeah. that thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's it's just like, not true. That's like old school like trade like that's like the trade uh It's an mentality. industrial Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's an industrial mindset applied to yeah, yeah. what was now called knowledge yeah. workers, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't fit. It's like we need it's these types of workers so they're going to send them Yeah. Um the other th although I will say, I will say I do regret not having a better or <clears throat> I do I wish I, I, I wish I would have spent more time in like the liberal arts degree, like in the classical sense of the term, like, like, a um, a liberal education comes from the idea of what would you, what would a person study if they were free liberal, free of economic, um, utility of that <clears throat> studying. So like, uh, we talked about this a lot when we were thinking about homeschooling, like, what do we teach our kids? Cause we have to come up with the curriculum. It's like, what do you teach a person? And 
if you're thinking about, okay, well, they need to get a job. That's one thing. But then you think, okay, well, if they don't need to get a job or, if, or apart from economics or eco an economy, what do you teach a person? And that's when I came across the idea of like a liberal arts education. The idea is if you were free of needing a job, what would you study? You know? And mm -hmm. I do wish I would have spent more time doing that, reading the great books and, and, uh, and that is my, don't point. be shy. I don't know what you're doing, but yeah, I do wish I would have spent more time philosophy, you know, just the, co the great conversation of human history, right? Like that's what that really is. So I wish I would have spent more time with that. Okay. Can we go to, uh, what are we going to go to now? Oh, we do. Let's answer. I want to actually real quick. I yeah. just want to say one real quick, uh, one real quick thing too. Is it Ryan? Yeah. Ryan here. So interesting that you bring up history and like, what do I do with this 25 years later? I was telling a friend of mine back in California who is this brilliant mind. He has this brilliant mind when it comes to especially his specialty in California history. Mm. Okay. There is absolutely an opportunity today more than ever before. You can crisscross, like I was saying earlier about yeah. the different things to study in school. You can crisscross things in a way today that helps you. You can set up a, and make a living that matters. Mm. So what would I do if I had a 25 year long history degree and like, what do I do with this? Interesting. Yeah. I figure out what my specialty is. So in this case, my friend, California history. Yeah. And he's super deep on this. Okay. California history, start a podcast mm. or a YouTube channel yeah, or yeah. both. Yeah. Find and especially you catch a wave, like what happened last year and last summer with uh, all the controversy, yeah. contro see, what? you're rubbing off on me. I said controversy. What do I say? Controversy. Is that the right word? What do I say? It's only because it's, it's controversy. Getting, this is this is like controversy. Late, this is late dad brain <laughs> I know, happening. I'm sorry, you know, it's like Contr no, no, no. controversy. Contr no, no, I, I think I did say it right. <laughs> I think you said it right. Yeah, especially last year with the controversy around uh, California history. Yeah, blessed or Saint Inupero Sarah. Yeah, um, the statues, the statues, stuff, yeah, yeah. churches, all of that. Yeah, that would have been. Yeah, a hot time mm -hmm. to have a podcast or a YouTube about channel or history. both yeah. about California history yeah. and going deep on it because he has told me stories that have blown my mind. Yeah, because I never got I never got taught that I never yeah. learned that growing yeah. up in California we yeah. didn't learn that in school. Yeah, so my point is, um, whenever so, one of the worst pieces of advice I got going into college about what to study was study the easiest subject you can and just get great. Grades. Yes. Yeah. And when Terrible. you're that young, that's what you're thinking. You're like, oh, well, I guess I'm supposed to get and your really parents good grades. Are stressed and out because they're like writing the check, right? And they're like, you better be getting good grades. And you're like, well, what am I going to get good grades in? Um, yeah. No. So find based, the ways to crisscross. Based that's on the Saint advice. history, I want to go to. I do want to answer some of these questions. Yeah, yeah. Let's Anna, keep Anna, shout out to Anna from the studio. Uh, she asked, why did your parents pick the name Sharble? And then asked, is it after the Saint Saint Sharble? Which I don't know much about him, but. Cool. And yeah. I'll answer the second question first. Yes, it is after St. Charbel of Lebanon. And the reason why uh, you got a minute, I got, yeah, a, I got, yeah, a, got a short time. story to tell you. Yeah, this okay. is my podcast. This is, <laughs> right, yeah. right. The show. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sponsored by, not sponsored by Topo Chico, but it sponsor us be. Topo Chico, please I sponsor mean, us. Really? He's we're trying like, hard. Listen, we'll we're make trying it happen. Very I'm going to get out of the way. He's got cases Look at all and that. cases of Topo Chico. <laughs> yeah. By the way, this is the most bubbly, sparkling water I've had in my life. It is. Yeah. It's intense and I love it's it. It's weird because. And it's it, Texas, by the way. Yeah. Uh, you don't see this in California much. So it, it, uh, um, if you leave like if you open a Coke can and leave it right here and then you open this and leave it right here and you come back like three days later, the Coke is flat. This is still bubbly. It's miraculous water from Monterey, Topo Chico. Monterey, Mexico. Miraculous water. Mineral. It water. comes out of the. It comes out of the ground. That bubbly. Wow, isn't that's, that crazy? That's amazing. Yeah, that's, that's a gift. True. And it that, mixes what great. Oh. Yeah, that's not mixes true. See, you phenomenal. Got, yeah. See, lay dad brain. <laughs> I tell uh, everyone that. Who, <laughs> who asked the question? By the way. Oh, uh, Anna. Okay, Anna. Yes, I'm named after Saint Charbel of Lebanon, and the reason why my parents named me after Saint Charbel in December 1981 on the solemnity of the Immaculate Conception. Your parents had a brainstorm session? They did not. <laughs> That's weird. <laughs> I do not want to imagine that. Um, sorry, sorry. But it did happen. Yeah. So, because uh, I'm here, obviously. Yep. They're on a flight to Venezuela. To My visit. dad and your mom. Right, because somehow, <laughs> some way, We've we got to be. This, we have the, same, be wallet. We the same, same wallet. We had the same wallet. We had like everything, like listen to the same podcast, like everything. 
Yeah, we really are the bizarrely the same person. Yeah. Um, I'm just gonna start calling you cousin. Okay. So cousin Ed. Cause <laughs> I could I could I could grow into that cousin Ed. Okay, sorry. Isn't that wasn't that a character? It sounds like yeah. Uncle Ed or something. I don't know. Anyways. Anyhow, um, it's the Immaculate Conception, December eighth, nineteen eighty one, on a flight to Venezuela. Okay. To visit my grandparents and my aunts and uncles and um, and cousins down there, so on this flight they're rushing. If in Newark, New Jersey, they're they're catching a connecting flight. They are sprinting through the airport to catch this connecting flight. So they're thinking we've got to make it. We got to get there. Um, they end up and actually I might be telling this wrong now. Uh, the point is, they they're on their way to Venezuela. One of the legs of the flight gets hijacked whoa my dad at this time in his in his life would keep a pack of smokes okay in his front pocket so my dad my mom my two older brothers are sitting in this plane takes off and they're they notice that there's a little bit of uh you know like a different voice yeah. on the intercom how big of a plane are we talking like uh it was like, a domestic flight I, okay. if i remember correctly and and now it's, it's sad that i I am um, forgetting it, some of the details. I think, if I remember correctly, they were uh, they had landed in Venezuela, um, and they were taking a domestic flight. Yeah, yeah. To get to so like a small, um, probably a smaller, a little bit of smaller plane, slightly like, smaller not like plane. a commercial, like huge, massive. I think they had already finished that. Leg. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so what ends up happening is they they hear a different voice on the intercom. They could tell it was a little yeah. more intense. Something yeah, yeah. something was off. Yeah. Um, that's when my dad sees. The hijackers coming down the aisle and while a few of the others i think there were about three or four total um, a couple of the others going by they're taking care of the front taking care of the back one walks by notices my dad is reaching for his pack of cigarettes and he tells him no permiso hmm. dad's like ah all right i'm was gonna, your dad gonna, gonna smoke back. on the plane yeah that was a thing, I guess, back then. I think in '81, you, you just smoke you, on you the plane. What you did? Yeah, Damn, they always right? have no smoking signs. Now on they the plane have the now. no smoking okay, signs. Okay, okay. Right? Well, it's a light, so that implies <clears throat> that they would turn the light off at some point. Yeah. Okay, so he says that. So um, he picks up on. He kind of notices my dad doesn't seem to be South American. Yeah. Uh, by his complexion and and his features and whatnot. So he's talking to my dad and he's asking him, "Hey, where are you from?" And dad's like, "From California." And he's like, "Oh, you're you're American, this and that." And he's like, "But but where are you where are you from?" And he's like, "Oh, we're Lebanese." And he's like, "Oh, do you, do you know this political leader? Do you know that political leader?" And he's like, "Well, I mean, yeah. I, I don't know them personally, yeah, but yeah. but the point is what ended up happening is my dad befriends this guy. The hijacker? The hijacker. One of the hijackers? How many the hijackers? hijackers like multiple? There were, I think there were 3 or 4 total. Dang. And one of them spoke a little English. And my dad's telling him, hey, so, you know, you know, your English is great. Like, where, where'd you learn your English? He's like, oh, I watch TV programs. And yeah. he's like, you know, your, your English is better than a lot of the people I know back in California. <laughs> he's just warming the guy up and yeah. befriending him, right? He built a relationship. This yeah. is why I said earlier, what's wrong with the world today is we don't do this anymore. Yeah. But in this high-intensity, high-pressure situation, my dad befriends the guy. Mm -hmm finds out that they're making a political statement they're not looking to hurt anybody hmm. and what they're going to do is reroute to aruba refuel let all the women and children off but all the men stay on hmm. as hostages dang not that bad aruba hey not right. that bad yeah you know uh man beach boys kind of popped in my head there for a sec that is crazy so it, so then what happens so he says look um can i just ask a favor after he's befriended the guy he says, can i ask a favor don't do this like, okay it's like <laughs> Um, you know, my wife's and the, and the hijacker notices like, you know, why is your wife crying so much? Like, yeah. well, you know, she's pregnant and she's worried that she's going to miscarry. You know, we're, she's really worried here. Um, how far along you, do you know how far along at that well, time? Well, at that point that was about, um, what's the halfway? Been, like if she was nervous of miscarriage, yeah. it's about, like pretty, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so five, let's say five months, it was yeah. five, five months in. Um, so essentially my dad asked like, you know, I understand women and children get off the plane, but my boys are nervous. My wife's nervous. Would you at least let me walk them to the door? Mm. And he says, yeah, you know, you can do that. He's like, okay, great. So my dad explains to my mom what's going on. He says, look, um, women and children are going to be off the plane. I can walk you to the door. And he was, you know, explaining to my brothers, here's what you're going to do. 
you're going to walk first, then mom, and then I'll anchor you. And you're going to walk. Don't run. I don't want any yeah, yeah. sudden movements, sudden movements or anything, or anything yeah. like that that, yeah. that that freaks them out. Just walk and be calm. And my dad tells my mom, look, if um, this is the last time I see you in, in the family, if you have a boy, name him after me. Name him Joseph after me. So... Hmm. So he'll know who I was, and so the family remembers me. Yeah. And if you have a girl, you know, name her what you like. Um, but it just promise me you'll name her, name him Joseph if, yeah. if you have a boy. Yeah. Um, so they land in Aruba. Everyone's getting off the plane. There was one older man who had cardiac arrest, and they they took him off the plane. Dang. The women and children were being you know escorted out. My dad's walking behind my family, but my brothers, my mom, and my dad's behind them. They get to the door. My brother stepped down, and this is tarmac style. Like you go down the steps. Have you ever been in Burbank? Or I'm like so old nervous school. about what your dad's gonna do in this okay. moment. Okay. Okay. So my brothers go down. My mom starts to step down. My dad takes a look both ways in the aisle, and he takes a step for the door. Oh no! Then he gets a gun in his back, uh, and he's they're basically like, like, "What do you think you're doing?" Oh right? no! The only, the only word or two. Maybe my dad knew two words of Spanish at that time. Yeah. But the really the word he knew was amigo. So he looks down the aisle and he's like, just saying over and over, amigo, amigo, uh, amigo. And just keeps yeah. pointing at the guy like, yeah, yeah. Hey, you know, that's your amigo said it's okay. Basically it's what he's trying to communicate. Yeah. The guy looks at him, looks at the hijacker buddy and just says, stop you. Just, just let him go. And lets him go. Let's my dad go. So my Dang. dad and the guy with the cardiac arrest are the only two men let off the plane at that point. Wow. Now, thankfully, thankfully officials detained them. They didn't get yeah. to take off again. Wow, that's good. Um, so everyone got to be safe. Everyone got home yeah. safely. My parents and my brothers made it to my grandparents' you know, town yeah. in Venezuela and uh, celebrated Christmas and all that. You know, They spent the rest of December there. Um, so then four months later, come April, April 82, okay. my mom gives birth to a boy. And my dad says, hey, so what do you think? Joseph, yeah. jo Joseph Jr. Right? Yeah, yeah. She says, well, not so fast. Huh? You know, while you were chatting with the hijacker, doing what you do so well, and I mean, I mean this is what my dad does. Yeah, this yeah. Is his, it's his. He gift. talks to hijackers. It's his. It's his, it's his charism. Yeah, yeah. He talks to hijackers. He's. <laughs> he can. Hijackers make friends. are drawn to him. They're drawn to him. Yeah. Absolutely. He can make friends with anybody. Okay. It's a total gift, and it's his charism, without any doubt. She said, "While you were doing that, I was praying, hmm. and that's my mom's gift, and." She said, I made a vow. I made a vow that if we get out of this situation safely and and I don't miscarry, and if we have a boy, that we'll name him after our our home country, our you know, that my yeah. parents are Lebanese, we'll name him after our home country's patron, Saint Charbel. Wow. So I was born a boy. Yeah. And my parents named me Charbel. That's why I'm Charbel. Wow. <clears throat> so your mom, your mom's uh your mom's kind of like, what do you um not bid, uh your mom's like negotiation wait what was your, your but your dad said that if you guys survived to call him sure no your dad said if he died my dad asked if if, if i don't if i don't ever see you again yeah, yeah, like yeah, if yeah, we're yeah. separated yeah, forever, yeah, yeah yeah name if you have a boy name him joseph, joseph. after me so you so, yeah. you so the family remembers who i was yeah. and like the name stays in the family right yeah. well my mom's making a vow and praying and you know by the grace of god like this is what that's a crazy story what you know he wanted and so they have a boy. My mom tells him, I made a vow. My dad said, yeah, you, we have to honor that vow. That's wild. Yeah. You know, my middle name is Joseph. And Get my out of here. No, nope. we are. Yep. We and are exactly the and same. My person. dad hijacked a plane in Venezuela <laughs> in about sometime in the early 80s. Yep. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. Wow. Uh, that was a great. Do story. you know what Charbel means? I, maybe no, Anna would what like does to know Charbel what means? it means. So I came to find out. Many years later, I didn't know this, um, maybe up until about 10 years ago, I was reading a book about St. Charbel, and it turns out uh, the name, if you break down the, the etymology of the name, Sharb and El. Hmm. So El, a lot of folks know, is, is God. So that's what you get it in Arabic, you get it in Spanish. Um, El is God. Sharb is ancient Assyrian, a like very old Assyrian language for story. Hmm. And in that structure, in that syntax, especially in Arabic, if I were to say watch Edmund, it means it's Edmund's watch. Yeah. It's a possessive. Yeah, yeah. 
So story God God's means story? God's story or the story hmm. of God. That's really cool. Yeah. Huh, that's really interesting. Man. Uh, what else we got? That's the most intense story I think we've had on the show. Uh, I do think we have to answer um, Patrick Hodge. Oh, Patrick Hodgdon. Hogdon. Hodgdon. Um, what is the best thing you've ever designed in your design hall of fame or most proud of? Besides your kids. Don't say that. Don't say your kids. Okay, I won't. That's what I thought. That would have been a cop out. <laughs> like, oh, my babies, my kids. Wow. That's, it's, it's, it's just so easy for me to say, like, I could, I could definitely draw upon some amazing experiences I've had yeah. you know, at Google and other tech companies. Um, very proud of how I've completely redesigned and re-architected very like manual processes that ended up scaling as Google like just went bananas and took yeah. off and, and grew like crazy. Um, I want to reflect on this more, but here's the answer I'll give. About six months or so into my my first year at Google, I had this itch. I really wanted to get into real estate investing. Mm. And I just thought, oh, you know, I'll invest in a condo and I'll rent it out and I'll make you know rental income. I get introduced to a realtor and he asks me, okay, I understand you want to do all that, but would you ever consider a fixer upper? And I said, no, 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 I can't do that. I, I don't know how to do it. It's like, well, I mean, you ever use any tools or anything? I said, no, no, I just, the only thing I ever did was I, I'd crack walnuts <laughs> and olives as a kid from my parents. Like my mom would brine a bunch yeah. of olives and I would yeah, crack yeah. walnuts after we go walnut picking. And he said, well, let me ask you a couple questions. He said, uh, do you know how to read? And I said, yes, of course. So can you follow instructions? Yes. So then you can do a fixer upper. Hmm. He said, look, I grew up in Montana and moved out here, you know, was in the Navy, went to college. I just read the books. Hmm. Like, why can't you read the books, follow instructions? Yeah. You can do a fixer upper. It's like, so, it's like the old version of YouTube. Just, just find a YouTube video about it. And what's funny about it too, yeah. is it was mm, probably toward the end of the project. It was about a year later. Google was trying to get into Google video. Hmm. YouTube was getting more popular and we acquired YouTube. Wow. So this was pre, yeah. oh, just find some videos yeah. on YouTube, right? Yeah. Um, so I would say one of the things that I'm most proud of in, in my, Patrick is so kind is like my design like hall of fame, fame or yeah, what yeah. he said. Yeah. Um, I would say, and the reason why is this. So my, my parents and I went in on it together. It was a total dump. Yeah. Absolute dump. Um, but I, I just saw what it could be. Yeah. I, I could, I transformed it in my mind the moment I saw it and I knew exactly what I was going to do to it. Yeah. That's cool. My dad saw it too. That's kind of where I get it from. Yeah. My mom apparently pulls up as I'm like, I'm in boots and coveralls on the first day that they arrive. And <laughs> apparently my mom looks at my dad in the car and said, this is it. <laughs> Like this is what we got. Like she what is like what's he getting himself into? She just stayed on that plane, Joseph. She just, <laughs> she did, right. She just stayed on that plane. <laughs> so um it took me much longer than than I expected. It took me 18 months, but um it turned out I I completely redesigned, rehabilitated, you know, whatever term you like to use. Uh, I transformed that place into a stunner uh, in that neighborhood. That's awesome. And everything that was there and everything that it became was exactly what I envisioned 18 months earlier. Yeah. And for me, it was very special because for me, it was, I, I saw something, I saw it, I saw what it could be mm -hmm. and I saw it all the way through Yeah, to the end of it, to yeah. the end of it. And it completely unlocked this entire side of creativity I never knew I had. Yeah. I didn't know that I liked working with wood. Yeah. I had no idea that I enjoyed paint, you know, painting, uh, finished painting or, or doing, um, finished carpentry, like yeah. baseboards and, and crown molding. I just had no idea that that was in me. That's um, wild. So that was probably one of the most special experiences. That's awesome. That's a good story. And for neighbors to tell me, thank you for finally doing this. Yeah. This house has been, a piece know, of crap. A piece of crap for, you know, in our neighborhood for so long. That's cool. That's really cool. 
Um, while we're queuing up the outro, because I think we're running out of time here, um, where can people go to find you, Charvel? You're launching a newsletter. You're going to be launching some other projects in 2021. Yeah, I think absolutely. people should get on your newsletter, and so that way they can get updates on stuff that you're launching. Um, you got some exciting things coming, but where can people go to find you on the internet? Yeah, find me at charbelsimon.com. It's C H A R B E L, charbelsimon.com. Personal newsletter, just launched it. I've got two out already. Over 60 people just in the past yeah. week and a half or so have been signing up. And it's just been, it's been really fun to see that. Like yeah. now that I've committed to sharing all these stories from my career and, and yeah. hopefully just passing something on to my 10 years ago self. Yeah. Totally. If I can help anybody out in any kind of way, um, by just committing to that, yeah. I've, I've just seen it grow really nicely and, and getting some really great feedback already. So that's been really special to see. So hit me up at charblesimon.com. Follow me on any social media, Charbel J Simon. So just yeah. follow me at, at Charbel J Simon. And if you're interested in making a living that matters and you don't want to take these really long, in-depth courses, nor do you want to get, you know, expensive coaching. What I'm trying to do is make practical playbooks and and video coaching accessible to more creators and makers mm. and founders. That's awesome. And um, uh, my my hope is that it reaches a lot of people, so more people can make a living based on like what is it that they can do to find those intersections in their life, make a living that matters to them, and um, and hopefully feel like they're, they're shining. Cause I, I really do believe what, um, what St. Catherine of Siena said it, when we are, who we're meant to be, we'll set the world ablaze. Mm. Um, and that's my goal with Sprint Wells, like help you make a living that matters and, and set us ablaze with who yeah. you are. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Sharble, you're going to help a lot of people. Adrian, what's, where can people find you on the internet, on Instagram? What's um, your Instagram at a dot creator, a Y E dot creator. Um, you can see my other portfolios from there, but I'm mainly on Instagram. So you check can also me find them on Tinder. So good ladies. No, no that's, on the, that's only a pure <laughs> marketing strategy <laughs> to gain Find models. them on Tinder, Tinder ladies, nope, uh, nope. local to Fort Worth. Nope. He's if, single. If you want to go on a date with me, I'll be like, look, sorry. Yep. Maybe Kyle, in a couple Kyle's years. on farmers only. So you can find him on farmers only. Catholic Matt, Catholic crush. Actually, it's a oh, Catholic okay. dating service. I'm involved right. in. Relax. Right. Oh. Okay. Well, that's it. Sharble. Thanks for coming on. Thanks hope, for having Hope me, to have man. you on again. I love and it. thanks everybody. Drinkstudiocoffee.com to buy coffee support the show at patreon.com slash the show or no no patreon.com slash the studio grapevine it's in the link thing you can find it but thanks everybody Five, you made two, it this far four, four, you're the real three, the real two, something you're the real MVP you're the real MVP there it is there we go and the next off awesome. you're oh, gonna God. die mm. ah! I'm Raymond Arroyo we'll see you next time what about time. me this is a long one I gotta be too oh, oh. I want to look at